call this meeting of the Westwood Planning Board to order. Welcome everyone. We'll start with a roll call vote of the board members. So, um, Mr. McCusker. Here. Mr. Paff. Here. Ms. Conant. Here. Mr. Gotti. Here. And I'm David Atkins. I'm chairing the meeting tonight. Uh, welcome to everyone. Uh, also to introduce our, um, our town planner, Abby McCabe, our recording secretary, Jessica Cole, and uh, town council, Pat Ahern, is on the call. And this meeting is being recorded and broadcast by Westwood Media Center. As are all meetings are recorded by Westwood Media Center and broadcast live on local cable television, Comcast Channel 12, and Verizon Channel 42. The meetings are also available on the Westwood Media Center YouTube channel and are live streamed. If you're having any trouble logging into Zoom, please go to zoom.us, click on Join Meeting, and enter the meeting ID, which is 885-9977-7649, and that will enable you to, when we get to the public hearing parts of this, we can recognize you and allow you to speak. Uh, so while people are uh, unmuted, please turn off your cell phone ringers to eliminate background noise. And uh, we begin this meeting with just the board members and the professional staff unmuted on video, and then I will recognize individuals to speak, uh, unmute them. Um, board members may choose to mute themselves when they are not speaking in order to minimize the background noise, but just remember to um, unmute yourself so that I can hear it when you vote or want to raise your hand or ask a question. Uh, so to outline our process, planning board meetings consist typically of three types of agenda items. There are applications that have been submitted to the board that may include a public hearing. There's other applications that are not a formal public hearing, but there's a, a meeting of the board and perhaps in the, the public will have an opportunity to comment at the board's discretion. And then we have some administrative items like meeting minutes and uh, updates and things like that. So prior to each agenda item, the chair will announce the item and provide some context then the chair will invite the applicant to address the board and give a presentation summarizing what is being requested. The board, our board members have already received these application materials prior to the meeting and have reviewed them. So we've already, and actually they're on the website that uh, anyone can access. Um, board members may ask questions during and following the presentation. Sometimes there'll be a professional staff, like a peer review consultant who gives a report and um, our town planner often summarizes the other boards and departments if they've had any uh, comments on something. Uh, in this remote meeting format, residents and guests may participate in several ways. Attendees should raise their hand and wait to be unmuted and recognize to speak over the Zoom meeting application or from a telephone dial-up where you would press star nine from the phone to indicate that you'd like to speak. Um, Following the public comment portion of an item, the board will deliberate, make a decision, or could continue the hearing to a future date. All these remote meetings pursuant to the governor's executive order require that votes be done by roll call. So we always go through that. The motion a second and then any further discussion proceed to roll call vote. And then I try to restate the results of that vote to make it clear what's mm -hmm. going on. So on the agenda tonight, there are three public hearings and a discussion item. The uh, first item on the agenda is, uh, and I don't think there's any changes to the agenda, correct, Abby? That's right. So the first item on the agenda is 384 Washington Street. This is a environmental impact design review and special permit public hearing uh, for the, which is triggered by a change of use of the retail sales and services and uh, is a request for special permit for parking relief. And we'll get into the details of that as the applicant presents. So with that, I would invite the applicant to be recognized and to present their application. Good evening, uh, Mr. Chairman and uh, members of the planning board. Uh, my name is David Hearn Jr. I'm an attorney at 470 Washington Street in Norwood. I'm representing Salvatore Frangiosa this evening. Mr. Frangiosa is on the call, uh, the meeting also. Um, uh, Mr. Frangiosa has asked for relief with respect to the parking requirements under the zoning bylaw 
for a business that he proposes to locate at 384 Washington Street in the Islington section of Westwood. Uh, it's a building that's been vacant uh, for a while, uh, located in the, in the local business B zoning district. Uh, the particular use is allowed as a matter of right. Um, it's a retail use. And um, I'll describe it uh, as this. Uh, Mr. Franzioso wants to um, sell granite monuments, cemetery monuments, headstones, if you will. Um, and what he proposes to locate at 384 Washington Street is a showroom where he can meet with prospective customers, uh, show them some samples, uh, and then place orders uh, for customers who have uh, agreed to purchase a uh, monument uh, from him. The monuments are manufactured and uh, uh, prepared elsewhere and then are shipped to Mr. Frangiosa. And uh, so there won't be any uh, manufacturing or, or uh, that type of work going on at the site. This is strictly a showroom where he will meet with people. Um, because of the nature of the work, it's a, a somewhat personal thing. And often you're dealing with people who are um, mourning the loss of a loved one. And so he uh, plans that uh, all of his appointments, all of his meetings with uh, prospective customers will be by appointment only. Uh, that's not the type of business where people would just drop in. I suppose it's possible that somebody going by might drop in, but uh, the plan is to set up the interior uh, so that he can meet with one group at a time, a small group of family members who would be making a, a purchase. Um, he expects to have one additional employee working um, at the site. So uh, on, on an ordinary day when no uh, customers are there, there'll be one or two people, Mr. Frangiosa, and his staff member, maybe only one of them at the site. And uh, on a day when he is meeting with a prospective customer, he might have uh, two or three or four people maybe arrive. Um, the issue that brings us before you is that um, under the bylaw, based upon the square footage of the building, uh, we understand that 11 parking spaces would be required. Um, the site doesn't really have 11 parking spaces. Uh, we have submitted a plan uh, that shows four parking spaces in front of the building and one to either side of the building. Th those to the side of the building would be for uh, Mr. Frangiosa and his employee, four spaces in front for um, prospective customers or, or clients visiting the place. There are um, uh, driveways that provide uh, an entrance and uh, an exit from the site. Uh, so somebody can drive in and then they don't have to back out. They simply drive out um, the second driveway that exits onto Washington Street. Uh, he uh, has looked for alternatives, including contacting Roach Brothers to see if they would be willing to uh, rent some space to him, uh, some parking spaces. Um, and the answer he got from Real Estate Council for Roach Brothers uh, yesterday, and I forwarded it to Ms. McCabe, this morning after I had received it last night um, was that they wish them luck. They think it's a great addition for the neighborhood that the business, but they can't rent them any spaces. So he's limited in terms of what he can lay out here. As I say, we've laid out six spaces. I do want to point out if you uh, have looked at the plan or have it available um, to the uh, left hand side, uh, right hand side of the building rather as you face it from Washington Street um, the entire side, uh, that side of the building is open with 15 feet of width. So we show one parking space there. Actually, we could put tandem parking there with the employee and Mr. Frangiosa. We also um, uh, could um, uh, put additional parking there if need be uh, for uh, uh, another customer if necessary. In the front of the building, we've laid it out with room for four, uh, as uh, shown on the plan in front of you. Um, the, uh, the, on the left-hand side of the building, looking from Washington Street, there's one space there, and that is actually a, an area that has a driveway that goes down to a, a concrete loading dock. So that doesn't lend itself to um, a lot of parking, certainly not by customers. And that's where, when he receives a completed uh, monument or headstone, uh, that's where it would be delivered and then he would install it on behalf of the customers at a local cemetery. 
Um, so the area that I'm talking about with the extra space, you can see on the other side of the building, as well as in the back, but that would really be for the uh, Mr. Frangiosa and his employee. Uh, we don't expect, and I'll, I can have Mr. Frangiosa speak in greater detail about how he plans to conduct the business, but he really doesn't expect to have more than a few people there at any one time. And while the requirement is 11 spaces under the bylaw, simply by um, the uh, square footage, the, the gross floor area of the building, 2,610 feet, I think it is, uh, or 2,612 under the building footprint shown in front of you, the, uh, uh, the type of business, the way he plans to run the business is such that there won't be as many people there as might otherwise be for another type of business. Um, this is uh, also um, an opportunity for a building that needs some updating to be updated. Uh, Mr. Frangiosa is a uh, mason by trade uh, and he proposes to, um, uh, with the agreement of the landlord, who I think may be on the call also, uh, Mr. Lambrianidis, um, uh, proposes to do some uh, repointing of the masonry of the building and then paint the building uh, to spruce it up somewhat. And that would uh, uh, be a benefit from an aesthetic point of view to um, make the building look a, a little fresher uh, for the neighborhood. Um, he also would like the opportunity, if possible, to um, uh, be able to show uh, some of the examples of the monuments outside along the front of the building. Um, and uh, that's, uh, I suppose, a form of advertising, but it's also a, a way to show, besides what he would show in the showroom itself, uh, to show the um, uh, prospective customers or somebody going by what business he's in. So that is um, essentially what he's looking for. I have I had submitted uh, a memorandum with, um, or applicant statement regarding the, um, some of the considerations that you have to uh, take into account in considering uh, the permit relief here. And, and I hope I'm happy to speak to that if you have questions. And also as I say, Mr. Frangiosa is here. I, I don't see him, but I think he, I talked to him earlier and he had signed on so that he may be available to answer uh, any particular questions that you might have. And we're, I'm happy to take some also, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. Um, are there any immediate questions from board members, because uh, we could also, we have a report from Beta and we have some staff comments. So Abby, what do we you know, summarize some of those additional? Sure. Um, we did have comments um, from staff um, in your packet that I'd also provided to the applicant. Um, the, the building commissioner and Beta had pointed out that um, one handicap Spaces is also required. Um, so there's none shown and um, we know it's you know, a, a tight site. Um, the building commissioner was also concerned about um, the layout of the proposed parking spaces. Um, you know, planning boards regulations call for 24 foot you know, aisles or drive aisles in the way um, they were submitted to be proposed. The parking spaces would have to back up. The four out front would have to back up out onto, um, out onto the street and over the sidewalk. Um, the Pedestrian Bike Safety Committee um, did provide comments as well. And their recommendation was um, to have two parking spaces, um, parallel spaces out front, not, not the four, not side by side, but only two um, in front of the building to at least allow um, cars to drive in and out one way. Um, so that they could get around those two um, two vehicles and then possibly could fit one to three on the side that um, the planning board would have to consider for tandem parking. Um, so if you were going to consider that, the suggestion would be that would be for um, employee parking on the side. So that could be coordinated getting in and out of there. Um, and um, that was the those were the staff comments and then um, Beta had also recommended um, cleaning the catch basin on site. I think that that was um, clogged um, when he went out there for a site visit. And then if, if there's any opportunity for improving um, stormwater drainage, that is a, a policy of the planning board. Um, so that's probably more for the property owner um, 
to, to speak to if the property owner is here, um, but usually the planning board is looking for drainage improvements when a new use is, comes before you. All right, thanks. <clears throat> thanks, Abby. Um, so I'm thinking that um, we it would be good to go ahead and take more public comment first and then discuss this because there are a lot of a lot of items to go over unless again if anyone anyone wants to speak just raise your hand uh, mr Gotti. so looking at this side i agreed with um commissioner doyle and chief silva's concerns on the parking plan as well as those expressed by the pedestrian bike safety committee i guess one of the questions that i had and i know the site is very tight in terms of the footprint of the building to the total footprint of the site itself. Is there any chance that that can be reconfigured to allow for employee parking in the rear? Um, that way you could have the two spots as suggested by the Ped Bike Safety Committee um, with a you know a driveway in and out. Um, so that, that's one question. My second question, and I'm glad the photos were uh, submitted as they were, how will you handle snow removal? Because the two um, proposed parking areas that you currently have at the sides of the building appear to be where all the snow is pushed, um, making the loading dock and proposed employee parking inaccessible. Um, so that's those are two questions that I have, I guess, for uh, Mr. Frangiosa and his council. Mr. Chairman, uh, perhaps Mr. Frangiosa could answer that. He's going to be in charge of the site. He'll be, um, if he's here, I... I... Let's see. Uh, he was here a moment ago. Um, don't see him right now. He appears to be back oh, in. Oh, the, yeah, let me... Raised. Okay, let me... <clears throat> There he is. Okay, Mr. Frangioso, you should be able to speak now. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can, thank you. So as far as the snow removal, um, if you're looking at the building on the right side, I guess I could push it back um, towards the Roach Brothers parking lot. There's a little guardrail back there, and then I can push on the left side up to the dock. And if I have to, I can, uh, I own a bobcat, I can truck the snow out of there too. Hope that answers your question. That answers the snow removal related aspect of the question. Are you able to reconfigure the parking in any, any way to put people in the back, uh, your, maybe your employees, so that you allow for the two spots out front and possibly the two that you would propose as your employee parking to be, um, client parking yeah if you if you are familiar with the building on the right side i'm able to drive down the right side and then take a left turn i could actually park a car in the back too it's about 20 20 feet before you hit that uh fence that belongs to roach brothers and if i recall the loading dock ramp is back there so how, how would you navigate around that with any pickup or delivery no the loading dock ramp is on the left side of the building there's nothing on, on the back of the building. It's just uh, asphalt. Hmm, okay. There right. is, there is uh, Mr. Gotti, um, if I may, uh, looking at the plan, I, I'm looking at the plan now. The Looking from the street, uh, the right-hand side of the building is open all the way down uh, along the side of the building. And then the rear of the building has uh, 15 feet from the edge of the building to the edge of the property. And that's not even to the edge of the, uh, the garden. There's room beyond that where the guardrail is. So there's, there's room there for uh, uh, the uh, employees to park, Mr. Frangiosa and his, his employee to park uh, on the back end of the right-hand side of the building and even in the back of the building. And that would free up space where we show a space now along that. That could be reserved for a customer if need be. Yeah, the, the idea of anybody backing out onto Washington Street is, is yeah. a can safety concern across uh, seemingly multiple staff members, chief, building commissioner, and then right. the ped bike safety. We, we agree with that. There, there are two driveways, one that you can use to enter this property, and a second to exit it. 
So somebody driving in to the property, say coming um, from the south, uh, heading northbound, has room to pull into the property, park, and then when they leave, go straight out, again, heading north uh, in the direction, say, of Roach Brothers and East Street. The way the, it's laid out, they can pull in and pull out. And the people who are likely to show up as customers are likely to show up pretty much at the same time and leave pretty much at the same time because this is going to be one customer or one set of customers uh, at a time for a meeting, not different groups coming at different times will be blocking each other in. That's that's the plan. Uh, it's not like a, a retail operation where you've got people coming in constantly all day long. So I think the, the way the driveway uh, and the curb cuts are shown, uh, there, there's plenty of room for somebody to come in uh, park and then head straight out without having to back out. And I agree with you, backing out onto Washington Street would be, it's, it's difficult enough sometimes coming out of uh, some of those places, uh, heading straight out, let alone trying to back out. I agree with you on that. So we, to, we could reconfigure if need be. So to kind of follow up on that, so what if you had, uh, the, the employee parking, like two tandem spaces in the back. And then you could have as many as maybe two on the uh, right side. And then two, um, instead of having four, like with like the pet bike committee recommending having two there, because that way you could get a, you know, you wouldn't be trapped if you had three or four cars. Um, would that work to have one, two, three, four, five, six spaces? And then even the seventh space in front of the loading dock is a sort of temporary overflow space. I, I think that would two, two for employees, the one uh, on the uh, aisle by the loading dock leading to the loading dock, two in the front and then potentially two along the right-hand side. Is that what you're saying, Mr. Chairman? Yes, so no. that would be one, two, three, four, five, six, a total of seven spaces uh sal that would we could do that right definitely yeah yeah yes i don't know if you can hear me yes we can okay um any anyone else on the board with a question or miss conant myself there we go um when do you anticipate deliveries i know it's hard to figure it but do you i don't know if you already own an existing business like this? Is it, I mean, right. how will deliveries be handled? Um, what, what, what happens usually, I, I take the orders uh, from the customer and every all the fabrication is done in Vermont. And uh, I would just coordinate with them and tell them, they would tell me when they're going to deliver the stone. It's usually like uh, four weeks after I place the order. Mm -hmm. So is it is it brought through the loading area there? Is that how you bring it in? Um, yeah, that's a perfect location for me because there's a dock there, so they can just back down to that dock, and I can unload the truck and just bring it into my showroom. So I guess what I'm ask, I'm wondering is whether we'll be able to actually consider that a parking spot if you'll be having deliveries. They're obviously they're not going to happen on a regular basis. Right. So you won't know when they're coming or going. So that will have to be left open for deliveries. And then with the parking in the front, you know, is the truck going to be able to pull in and pull out without having to back out onto to Washington Street, which will impede the traffic a little bit? No, again, if you um, if you enter on the Norwood side, let's say, mm -hmm. um, and he pulls out onto um, um, onto the Roach Brothers side, then he can back down to the dock, if that makes sense. And uh, naturally, when I'm getting a delivery, there won't be a car there. Ms. Conan, are you wondering about, like, will he have advance notice or will the deliveries <coughs> come at a particular time of day or? Yeah, because if, you, if we're going to say, so we'll, we're going to allocate that as a parking spot, and then he has to get a delivery at the same time there's a parking spot there. Um, we really don't want to have that that situation. We can't really al allocate it as a parking spot unless you're able to reserve that spot when you know you're getting deliveries. I mean, it, it's a tight spot. So I, I, I mean, it's the delivery not, concern me a little bit. It's not like I'm getting deliveries every day. 
So um, I'm sure they'll they'll call me in advance and I can make sure there's no cars there. And also too, so of all the parking spots, you're including the ones you're asking for waiver seven, was it? But yes. And two of the spots are for employees, right? And then yes. one's for handicap, so that's three. And I know that when when one of my parents passed away, all of us showed up in different cars to go and and you know pick things out. And that's just another concern. Um, typically, they don't show up in one car, so we have to take that into consideration as well. Well, I'm hoping that there won't be more than four cars from a family, and then my car would be in the back. So that's a total of five. I don't Plus know. the employees. And so then, like like we Mr. Hearn said, we can do tandem on the right side and then I can also stuff them in the back of the building. My car and my employee. So there's there's four spots and there's on the right and the left side, actually there's six spots out front. If if it's uh if the parking in the front is reduced to two, one of which I think would probably be a handicap spot um we can still put one or two along the right side for customers again these customers are likely to be arriving and leaving at pretty much the same time as opposed to other retail operations and um uh, and then as i think uh, the chairman mentioned the spot in the aisle where the um it leads to the loading dock can be used if necessary um by a customer coming in there so i think that in the uh, occasional situations where there might be maybe four cars showing up for customers, the room is there for them. Th this is a, I mean, it's a tight spot in that the way this building was built, I think it was built about 1964. There wasn't a lot of consideration given to parking. Um, and uh, this is a use uh, among all the uses that would normally be allowed in that district and for this, this particular site. The proposed use is one that, um, while it's retail, doesn't attract a lot of people at once. Um, it's not, you know, let's show up for a sale on this day or that day. It's it's going to be by appointment. So, and and I suppose one of the questions that Mr. Frangiosa can ask when he makes appointments is, how many people do you think are coming? Just so we'll be, you know, we'll be ready. And he and his employee can park in the back or park way back on on the right hand side. And be out of the way and leave plenty of room for the, the people coming in. So not there's not a unfortunately we're not starting with a great layout, but that's the layout that there is. And almost any business coming into this site is going to need some sort of relief or else they can't fill the property, I think. Dave? Yes. Mr. Mr. Paff. Thank you. Um I think Mr. Hearn brings up a, a, an excellent point that I have been thinking about, this is essentially an existing non-conforming situation. Um, we have a building in Westwood that will never allow us to have parking considerations to our standards. And if we want anyone to occupy this building, we're going to have to make some concessions. And I think the fact that they're asking to open a business where it's, the traffic is going to be by appointment only, or essentially by invite only, uh, I think it probably is the best situation that this this building can have to house a retail uh, situation. Um, I am not a fan of the drawing of the four spots in front. There is apparently no extra room for a wheelchair to get in if there were four cars there. It doesn't look at all to be ADA compliant to me. Um, the discussion that went uh, through, I, I think there's no way that this board could strike and approve four spaces as depicted in that. Um, and it really isn't, we can't always presume it's going to be the best case scenario. We have to assume there's going to be problems with snow, uh, poorly parked vehicles, things like that. Um, things do happen and we have to make those allowances that there's ways for people to get out of this situation. I do like the idea of the left side um, space for emergency only uh, or emergency situation of parking on the way to the loading dock. I think you can have no more than two striped uh, 
spots in front, one being handicapped. And then if there's enough room in the back for two employees, um, I would say at most, you don't want a tandem situation for, for customers on the right side. It's one thing for employees, but I just, I don't know that that's something we want to consider for the, uh, the customers. Um, so, but that still gives you four spots, two in front, two, one on each side, and then I'm, I'm told there's enough room for two in the back. Um, and maybe one of the employees can be on the side towards the back, but not designate that for customers. Um, that's my thinking. I, I, I think that drawing that was um, shown earlier, there's just no consideration for ADA compliance there. So I, I would not even consider that. Um, but I think the discussion that has gone on has uh, illustrated, I, I think, some really good options. Um, and as we said, it's not ideal, um, but it's what we have to work with. So I think this board needs to come up with something that does work. Otherwise, we will forever have an empty building in our on our hands. And I think this by appointment only situation is the best way we can come up with traffic control and parking control, because that's the that's the real problem here. The one question I had for the applicant, um, do you have a situation uh, like this right now, a retail situation that you're moving from, or are you operating out of your home and you want to move it to a, a new uh, commercial place? No, I have a uh, friend of mine that's been uh, doing the business for over 50 years, and he's currently in Medford, and he's kind of guiding me through, but uh, I've been in the masonry business and granite business for over 40 years, so it's yeah. a Chris, if you had been doing this by appointment situation and you're just moving it, but uh, where do you do this work now? Um, actually, I've just been working with um, my friend in Medford. Okay. So is this also going to be your day-to-day -day office? Is this where you come to do your work or yes. you're going to meet people there only? Yes. Yes. Sorry, I asked two questions. Yeah. You said yes. Um, we, yeah, it's going to be my office. I'll meet people, customers there. Yes. Okay. Okay. Not for, not for the current business I'm in, for just for Monument. Okay. And I think Mr. Gotti's uh, point about snow removal is a good one. Um, I don't think you can accommodate all the cars that have been discussed tonight without removing it off site with a significant snowstorm. Uh, I think there has to be some something, some allowance is made for that. I, I just don't see there. I mean, those pictures, it's tight as it is with that relatively small amount of snow. Uh, you get a little bit more and you'll lose your access to the loading dock or the, the, the run down this other side. So right. I think the type of operation manual or something uh, indicating what the plan is there. That's all I have, Dave. Thank you for now. Thanks, thanks, Chris. Um, Mike, do you have any questions? As far as snow removal goes, uh, you say you have a uh, wooden guardrail in the back. Is that gated into the uh, Roach Brothers parking lot, or is that solid the entire length of the property? Uh, I believe it's solid. I don't. I haven't seen a gate there. Okay. Well, my question is, is just, you know, for snow removal, get the, I know it's easy enough to get the bobcat in and through there to pick up snow, but now you're gonna have to back it out onto Washington Street to dispose of it into a truck. Well, not, not true. If I put the truck parallel to the building in front, I can just, uh, if you know a bobcat, it turns on a dime, it just oh, does yeah. a 360. So I can stay right on the property at all times. There's no need to, leave the property at all. But you still have to plow it out in front and push that snow somewhere to put the truck there in front. Well, I think I would plow it down into the dock. That makes sense for me. And then just, if, if there's too much snow, I could uh, get it out of there. Truck it out of there. Okay. Um, you know, I agree with what Chris says about the parking spot. We're just dealing with an old building that we're never gonna be able to you know, get get it together and make it to uh, to you know come up to any standard that we're used to in this day and age. 
Um, I'm okay with the park. I just want to make sure we got So we're talking about two in the back, two in the front, one ADA compliant handicap spot. And we're doing what? One down the side, well, one on the north side, and one on the south side? That's, that's my understanding, Mr. Chairman and Mr. Pesker. And... And that's all the questions I have. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Just to clarify, so that so on the on the south side, I guess, or the right hand side, when you're looking at the building, so you're going to where that additional space is. I mean, that's the driveway that the employee that you will um, use to get to the back parking spaces, also. So I would expect that in an extreme, if you had um, if you had one, two, three, four, if you had five cars come all at once, then um, they probably will just pull, if two people are, you know, in the same family or something, they probably would pull in all the way and you they would end up using two spaces there. You know what I'm saying? Like it's, it'll take some coordination, you know, any way you do it. But I don't know that we would, we could not designate that as an actual parking space, but effectively it'll be, if you had that situation where um, there were five people coming together or even, yeah, they probably would park in tandem because there's nowhere else to park. Uh, I, I think in, that's correct, Mr. By, Mr. Chairman. Um, we've got 15 feet of space there. Uh, there's room for folks to, if they had to, park tandem. That's fine. We don't expect that. But uh, Sal, you were going to say something on that, I think. I was just going to say, being by appointment, I could let the families know that I don't have a lot of room here. so. You know, I can't have four people show up at one time. I just give them a heads up. And then um, just to clarify on the, the loading dock situation. So how big of a truck are we talking? Um, like what I want to know is whether it'll be able to pull in from the, um, the Norwood side and then um, like turn to the left and back up. I just want to avoid the situation where they stop on Washington Street and back into the loading dock. Is that how yeah, it is? It's a flatbed truck, it's six wheels, no more. So like a small dump, but with a flat body. So you're saying that it would, um, it would be maneuverable enough that they would yeah. not, have, yes. they wouldn't be stopping on Washington Street and then backing into the driveway. Yes, I'm, there's no but need to get a trailer truck in there. There, it would. I could see it could be problematic if there are two cars parked in those, in the handicap and the other spot. It might be difficult for that flatbed to maneuver to to back up. You may have to ask one of those people to move that car in that situation. I, I agree, but I'm going to know ahead of time when I'm going to get a delivery. So or no, it's just I th I think it's this is not a typical commercial situation. Yeah. This is almost having a party at your house and you need to talk to everyone about where's, where it's okay to park and where it's not. Right. Okay, um, let's see. Uh, this is, it is a public hearing, so I would ask- I'm Sorry, I just, I've had my hand up for a bit. I'm just gonna, um, I have a question, I guess for Pat. Um, does the appointment only nature of the business um, change the ADA compliance of debt allocating one entire spot of what we're talking about? to a handicap situation? I just, I don't know the answer to that. I don't believe it does. Um, very little mitigates handicap access at all, uh, uh, even, even by appointment. Right, so that would effectively mean that the one of those two spots out front, you know, fairly frequently would go unused. Yes, okay. probably. And I also wanna add that with the ADA compliance out front with the space, you're not going to have any room for displays out front. Hmm. I wonder, Mr. Chairman, on that point, the we have 22.6 feet from the face of the building to the edge of the property. Uh, and there is a curve along the edge of the property. Um, the Mr. Uh, Frangiosa, I think, told me that uh, the width of these 
stones is typically, what did you say, Sal, you measure them eight inches or? Yes, and the base would be 12 inches wide. And there, there's actually a concrete apron that goes along the front of the building now. Um, That's probably two feet wide, but again, I would only be looking for 12 inches. I mean, I think I think you have to have a a plan that shows that you're not blocking the sidewalk, that you're that the handicapped space is accessible. You know, we have to make sure that all the boundaries are met. And then if there's room after all of that, then I think it's work. But yeah, what they use to measure that is a radius. You know, it's it's not basically a pathway; it's a radius of, in all directions from the area. Right. We also need to understand what is being used to stop the cars essentially from driving into the building. Are we using curbing, bollards, um, or you know, running right into your monuments? Um, typically, we'll you know we have something to keep cars from uh, going right through the the building if someone mistakenly hits the gas instead of the brake, or at least slow them down. So I haven't seen anything discussed about how to protect the building. Hello? Yeah, I, I haven't brought it up, but I did plan on putting a couple of bollards in the corner of the building as you approach it from the, the Norwood side. So- I think we'd like to see it maybe in addition to the corners, but in front of each car parking space so that they cannot can, in, encroach upon the building. We'd like to see something to keep the cars in the parking lot and not moving towards the building. Even like the smaller curbs. There, there is uh, an existing concrete curb that goes parallel to Washington Street now. By the building? Um, before you hit the sidewalk, there is, yes. It's no, about I'm talking about curbing to keep the cars in the parking area and not get too close to the building. Oh, okay, so you, you're asking for another curbing before I go Just into the building? Take parking lot curbings that are precast concrete. Uh, I, I think you need to propose something of what you're going to do so we, we know what to expect in this parking situation. I, I hear you, I agree. I think Mr. Chairman, we could um, revise the plan uh, and, and I don't know what your practice is, whether you, if you were inclined to grant the request for relief subject to a plan being submitted to the planning department and the building inspector for um, showing the revised location of the spaces and the protection for the building that uh, Mr. Pfaff just mentioned that, that I think Mr. Franciosa has in mind um, and uh, authorize the, the planner or the building inspector to sign off on that. I, I don't know if that's your practice so we allow that or whether we'd come back uh, with a submitted a revised plan um, to respond to the comments, whatever you want to do on that. I think it's I think it's up to the board members. I think we could um, I'd outline all the requirements here, but um, what do people think? Well, I think as far as an outdoor display, if they still want to move forward with an outdoor display, they have to give us a site plan, draw it up to a specific area and give us the radiuses. So we're sure that everything is compliant with the ADA. Are you talking about an outdoor display of the monuments? Because I thought that was not going to be displayed outdoors. Uh, my client would like to be able to put a couple along the front of the building, um, which is uh, typical of this type of business. Uh, if you look at other monument shops in the, uh, in the area, uh, they typically will have uh, one or two up against the front of the building so people see. Uh, this building has, I think, tinted windows. So it's not as if somebody going by knows what business is going on there but if they see something it it uh is a form i suppose of advertising this is what we do here uh and they could call and make an appointment if they wanted otherwise they don't really know what's going on there but mm -hmm. they could be up against the front of the building as they are at similar monument shops i can think of one in norwood and some over in west roxbury um and in a way we think that they could be done but we'll have to show you that they won't interfere with ADA compliance or with access to the building. And um, uh, that the parking, there'll still be plenty of room for parking. I said we've got 22.6 feet uh, from the front of the building to the uh, edge of the property. 
even with uh, ADA compliance, um, I think we have some still have some room there um, and it wouldn't interfere with the doorway or anything like that. So we're happy to demonstrate that, I think, in a, uh, uh, a revised plan that might uh, uh, assuage some of the concerns here. And, and I agree that it's appropriate to um, revise this plan. Mr. Hearn, I had uh, one question. You, you, are these monument displays in lieu of any signage on the building? I'm sorry, I didn't understand the question. Could you repeat it? No, I'm sorry, I didn't say Mr. Ahern. I miss it, Mr. Hearn. Sorry. Um, no relation. <laughs> is there going to be signage on the building for the business? I hope to put signage. Um, there's um, a brick facade in the front above the windows. I hope to put something up there. There's a sign there now, I believe, uh, pre existing sign there, at least I saw in the pictures. Um, I, I, I think that might. That might be something else you'd want to consider in, in your submission. Um, show us what you plan to uh, to put up there. I, I, I find signage is fine as long as it's you know within our bylaws and right. uh, doesn't detract from the neighborhood. We understand. Right. And the uh, the monuments. I mean, I don't know. I think our practice a lot of times here is to give you all this feedback and then continue the hearing and come back with. Um, with something that we can finalize. And so I think that's kind of where we're headed here with, um, and we still assuming that we're good with it overall, uh, mm -hmm. because yeah, the sign, what the signage looks like is critical to it. How the monuments um, are gonna be, like if there's a way to use the monuments as, as part of those, like instead of a big yellow bollard, that might actually be better, but um, let's continue any other, any other feedback. My, my, my gut right now is I don't think we have so many outstanding things. I don't think administration is, is the way to go here for Abby. Um, I, I think we need to come back as a board and, and hear their uh, revised plans and, and move on from there. I just think there's too many open-ended things here that we need to uh, tighten up. That's my, my feeling on this. That's fine, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I understand and I'm not familiar with your practice on that. So. If that's how you normally do it, we certainly would go with your uh, requirements on that. All right. Any other any other questions here? Then, um, all right. It's a public hearing, so I'll open it up to um, anyone who has uh, questions. I see one hand raised in the attendees, but um, anyone else who wants to speak could uh, raise their hand in Zoom, or if they're on the phone, press star nine. Actually, can we tell if there's anyone on the phone? It's sometimes helpful just to know that there's no nobody on the phone. I don't see anyone on the phone now. So we can just go. We've got a couple of people with their hands raised. So I will recognize uh, Christina first. Hi, Christina Martin, 23 Brookfield Road. Um, I just want to be sure that the uh, prospective tenant understands that they're abutting a um, like a, a family neighborhood. And after the this year that we've had, a lot of people have been really traumatized by um, loss and death. So um, the idea of having tombstones on display in front of the business is really upsetting to some members of the immediate community. So I hope that you will take that into consideration when you do any kind of design or layout that like, honestly, if those could be at the back of the building, I know you wanna use that as advertisement, but I feel like maybe a sign just like the dentist down the street uses is adequate. Um, having tombstones out in the middle of a road that kids walk along on their way to school, they get picked up on the bus there. There's families walking to Dunkin' Donuts. There's people walking to the train station. I just feel like so many people have been traumatized by death and loss this year that to have to face tombstones um, potentially every morning and night on your way to work, on your way home, could just really be really damaging to a lot of people's mental health. So I just ask that as a good neighbor, if you are to move into that location, that you please consider the immediate neighbors um, and people who make this their home 
and try and be respectful of our needs as well. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Um, and I'll recognize Melanie McNally. And if you could just like enter your name and address. Can you hear me? Can you yeah. hear me? It's actually uh, Joe McNally. How you doing? I actually, um, I live directly across the street at 379 Washington Street. And um, um, this, this property across the street from us has been vacant for a long time. So my family and I would love to see somebody in that property, but I have a lot of the same concerns. Um, number one, uh, the obvious thing would definitely be the tombstones. We're not super excited about seeing tombstones directly outside of our window. Um, but, um, you know, living on the main street, we understand that we're, you know, uh, completely across the street from uh, commerce. But I just don't see the amount of space, uh, no, no matter who goes uh, over there. You have one handicapped spot. We have employee parking. We have customer parking. And also, we are looking to put a flatbed um, in that loading dock. And uh, living across the street, and I'm actually a, um, uh, um, a construction worker, so I'm constantly backing a truck into my driveway. So I know how difficult it is to take a, uh, a regular pickup truck and back it into my driveway across the street. So um, I know it's probably going to be hard to get even a um, F-550 in there, which is a short wheelbase um flatbed but um i can only imagine that it would be going in probably early in the morning because if i own the place no matter what's going in there i would probably want to get it when there's no cars so uh, that's a concern of mine and i'm guessing uh, my immediate neighbors that you know we wouldn't want a flatbed going in there say at six in the morning to take tombstones off but um on top of all of this so all these spaces and the uh loading dock in that small area, um, you know, the display, um, even if it wasn't something that was uh, controversial like the tombstones, I just don't see how you can have all that in that in that one area. It just, to me, seems very congested. And like everyone else is saying, if it does snow, um, you know, I, it is, you know, it, it's gonna be tough. You know, the, the guys that were there before had a tough enough time, they had one car park in there. So these four parking spots out front, including um, handicap, is uh, I don't I just don't see it myself. But um, the other thing, well, lastly, would be I guess the signage too. Um, you know, there is no sign currently there, so I would definitely be interested in what the sign looks like. But um, that's all we really have. Thank you for your time. Thank you, thank you, Joe and Nelly. Um, is there anyone else? Anyone else in the meeting who wants to raise their hand? I'm not seeing anyone else. All right. Um, um, Steve, if, I guess if I, if I could add, um, the business has allowed a wall sign, um, also an additional sign. So you could do a, um, projecting glade sign, something like that. So you could also have your a logo or an image on, on the sign itself. So that may be more effective than having displays. You could use your sign to show what your business is. Um, and that's pretty common on like the, um, the projecting blade signs. We'll often have an image. Mr. Chairman, we can, uh... My client and I can discuss that, and maybe with Ms. McCabe, we can have a conversation about that to, to follow up since it, uh, this is not going to be, a, I don't think this is going to be resolved tonight, and that, that's something we can follow up on uh, and submit something at a continued hearing at your pleasure. All right. What, um, among, uh, among board members here, I kind of had a list of things that um, seems like, well, does anyone want to? summarize anything or um, we need to give them guidance if they're if we're going to continue this uh, we, if we think it's no way it can work then we would probably want to just then um, see this is a EIDR would we Abby is it even do we did not would we deny it or what would you 
Um, it is an EIDR, but it's also a special permit for the parking relief. Okay. Um, and so the next, the board, planning board's next meeting is Monday, April 26th. Um, so for the applicant, do you think um, you could get a revised plan back to the planning board in, in that time? That's about, I think that's almost just under three weeks. Yes, I'll work on it. I'd like to make sure we have all of the um, input from board members because we wouldn't um, uh, we wouldn't want we wouldn't want them to go to a lot of work if we feel if they're, if we feel that it's not going to accomplish what's desired. Um, so could we kind of just go around and um, state kind of do you, how do you feel overall on this application? And uh, I think Mr. Path, you already expressed your point of view. Um, but um, just if you want, if others want to, because you know what I'm saying, like, I don't, yeah, let's just see if there's any, Mr. McCusker, do you have a, your thoughts? Uh, I'm fine with the project. Uh, we just gotta figure out the park and get that drawn up so we understand what we're all speaking of. Uh, and we have to figure out uh, the display out front if it's gonna happen or not, if there's, there's room to do it, if it's appropriate to do it uh, and signage to see what, you know, what they're gonna go forward with. Uh, I feel confident we can come to a decision at the next meeting if these three things are presented to us. Uh, Ms. Ms. Conant? Yeah. Um, so one of the things that's obvious is that the, the parking lot needs to be restriped. So if we're restriping it to accommodate his parking, then you can't really stripe the, um, the loading area. So you really can't count that as a spot per se. And not just looking at his business, but future businesses down the line in terms of the restriping, it is a tight spot. So it would give other people, you know, later on down the line sort of ideas as to, for them for parking. The other thing is aesthetically, we talked about the monument shops in West Roxbury and Norwood. Those aren't in town centers. And aesthetically having the monuments out front, I agree with Christina that, you know, to the side or to the back may be a better option, but I think people need to see um, what that would look like as well as the signage. Um, you know, what will that look like? So I think you need to bring forward some sort of parking, what the parking will look like, what the signage will look like, and some thoughts on where the monuments could go. And in one of my other concerns, and another gentleman had agreed, was is the, the loading zone in terms of drop deliveries. That's something that we need to look at as well. Thanks. Um, Mr. Gotti, thoughts? Sure. Um, you know, don't know that the headstones out front are necessary to convey what the business is if other signage is available to use. Um, that being said, I agree with Chris's observation that given the nature of the size of the property, the size of the building on the property, that there is going to have to be some type of accommodation made for any business that is going to be going there. And, you know, this business is a retail business and it complies with local business B zoning. So from that standpoint, you know, we have, I think we have an obligation to allow Mr. Frangiosa and Mr. Hearn to come back to us with a revised plan um, and hear what they have to say there. So that's that's my two cents on it. All right, thanks, thanks. So that's, and I have similar thoughts like this is maybe one of the few uses that would work in this space. It's we got a built-in need to coordinate the parking. Um, so what we're asking, being asked to do is to reduce the um, parking requirement but it sounds like that could be workable. But if you, we need to see what it's gonna look like, um, how it's actually to ensure that the, um, that the handicapped issues, that the handicapped space is truly usable, that the um, snow removal is taken care of, um, that the, the truck uh, is, that that's realistic. Um, and actually just even the parking in the back, um, is, is, is that gonna work? Like, is there enough of a turn radius to, to get two vehicles behind the building so that you can then have the other spaces out front. I think the, um, obviously that the original plan with four spaces, no way, that's not, there's not room to open your door. So um, it has to be two spaces in the front, one of which is handicapped. Uh, 
Anything? Am I missing yeah. anything there, Chris? Um, I, two things. One, um, as we're circling back on the list of things, the, the snow removal, I think, is a real consideration that needs to just be explored and a plan articulated. Um, and the other thing um, I indicated that I think the by appointment only is the only way that a lowered parking number amount is going to work um, to that. I think that a condition needs to be uh, um, put in that if that were to change, that this business stops being a by appointment, then that is a violation of the parking reduction. Um, so I think it needs to, needs to uh, be stated that the only consideration, the only reason we're given a lesser parking arrangement is the nature of this business is by appointment only. Um, so I, I, I think something like that needs to be addressed in the, uh, in the decision, a favorable decision. Can we make it, Abby, do you think we could make it conditional is, is essentially that would trigger a change of use like this is we are. Yeah. It triggers a change of use, which would trigger another EIDR. So if uh, that, I think that would be the way to do that. Right. You could condition your special permit approval based on the appointments only. All right. Um, I think that captures what we need. Is it clear to everyone what we're expecting them to come back with such that we can, because we're also, we would, it'd be best if we were able to make a decision at the next meeting, uh, just because of the timing of of uh, board members and turnover and everything. All right, uh, and there was no additional um, public comment, I don't think, so I'm not seeing anything there. So I think what we need is a motion to continue this uh, hearing to um, the next, to the, what, the April 26th, or what's the date? Yeah. Yes. Monday, April um, 26th at 7 p.m. on Zoom. So moved, if that's sufficient. Second. All right, there's a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Dave, the only other question that I have, I'm sorry, is there sure. are a number of questions in the Q&A. Some of them are duplicative to things that were asked, so I don't know if you need to go through any of those. Okay, let's see. So the in the q and I will read, uh, I'll read the q and questions. Um, Fran Fusco, I highly oppose having headstones displayed outside the building. It's not the appearance we wish for Islington Center. Justin, um, in regards to the headstone store, this seems like a best laid plans issue, meaning this is all assuming that no random person pulls in and blocks someone forcing someone to back out to Washington Street. I get this is the plan, but is either any reason to believe people in real life will follow the plan? And um, Christina, it's that's the same, Christina Martin, I think the same person who spoke earlier. So I will assume that um, she said things. Uh, let's see, here's um, Joseph Prevatera. Can't the applicant just install the same number as Roach Brothers and CVS does? same number of parking spaces. Justin says, doesn't advertising out front encourage drop-ins even this particular business? Uh, and Fran Fusco says proper signage will note what the business is. All right, so any further, uh, any further discussion? Then we have a motion to continue this to our April 26th meeting. Uh, we'll have a roll call vote. So Mr. Paff? Yes. Uh, Mr. McCusker? Yes. Mr. Gotti? Yes. Ms. Conant? Yes. And I vote yes as well. So this will be continued to our Zoom meeting at 7 p.m. on April 26th. And uh, thank you to the applicant and uh, the uh, business owner. Thank you very much. Thank Good you. Night, everybody. Thank you. Thanks. Good night. Good night. Good night. All right, the next, uh, the next item on our agenda is the public meeting item. Let me make sure, I got, no, no, sorry. That's, uh, the numbering is different here. The next item on the agenda is a public hearing another environmental impact design review um, for 710 and 722 High Street. 
And this is uh, an application to combine those properties and to build the all town fresh. So um, I will uh, recognize the applicant to come before us and present. Um, members of the board, my name is Paula Devereaux. I'm an attorney at Pierce Atwood, and I am here representing Global Montello Group Corp with the Environmental Impact and Design Review uh, portion of um, the project that is under consideration. I'm joined by members of the global team, um, as well as members of BOLA Engineering, Zach Poison, um, and uh, Rebecca Brown from a GPI, who's our traffic engineer. Um, we're here before you um, under section 7.3 of the zoning bylaw um, in order to, um, uh, Global owns two gas stations, the Gulf Station and the Mobile Station on High Street. Um, they're seeking to demolish the Gulf Station um, and add a small addition to the Mobile Station building. Um, as well as an additional um, canopy and, um, and, um, and dispensing tanks. Um, and then also, um, uh, so we know we need, so we're here for EIDR approval, um, but we're also going to be going forward to the Zoning Board of Appeals because we need special permits from the Zoning Board of Appeals for um, the light, um, for the, uh, the gas station uses. Um, and um, we are in a, uh, so for the motor vehicle light service, which is the actual use that we'll be seeking the special permit for. Uh, the current, both stations have special permits right now, um, but the building inspector has requested that we go forward to the Zoning Board of Appeals with, um, for a new special permit for these uses. Um, we're within the local business A district. Um, we're also within the water resource protection overlay district. And as we'll go through, when you see the site plans, um, the property is also um, in the single resident C district to the rear of the existing building. That will remain. There's nothing that's planned in that uh, part of that district. And all the improvements are part of the local business A district. Um, and right now I'd like to introduce the um, representatives from Bowler Engineering and also from Global, um, who will uh, show you the, um, we have some renderings um, and a site plan as well. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Paula. Um, as uh, she had said, my name is Zach Poison. I'm with Bowler Engineering. Uh, I'm working uh, as the design engineer for this project. Um, I do have some plans open. Uh, Abby, I don't know if it's easier for you to share and then for me to walk through them or if you want me to share my screen. Um, you should be able to share your screen. That might be easier um, okay. to flip through. All right, let's make sure I get the right one. I think that's the one I want. All right, can uh, everyone see? Yes. All right, great. Um, so I'll start all the way back at the beginning uh, real quick. So um, I'm sure you're all familiar with the site. Uh, these are just some street view images. This is looking in from the Northern driveway toward south towards the intersection of um, Hartford and High Street. Uh, this existing canopy will be staved uh, and extended further south down this way. Uh, the existing portion of the uh, convenience store will also be saved and extended further south. Um, and renovated uh, and improved on the exterior. Um, I'm gonna scroll down a little bit more and this is again, looking directly into the site from uh, High Street uh, with the pylon sign that should be staying, uh, modified a little bit to uh, adjust for the additional services. Um, and I'll just keep scrolling down. And again, this is looking north from the intersection uh, at just in front of the existing Cumber, Cumber, uh, existing uh, golf station. And again, uh, about the same spot, looking towards Hartford, uh, Hartford Ave. Uh, sorry, Hartford Street. I grew up on Hartford Ave, sorry. <laughs> um, and this is again, looking into High Street from uh, into the golf station. 
and looking further down south uh, with the Gulf Station again on the on the left. Um, and looking directly from uh, Hartford Street into the site across the intersection. And I'll believe I'm in the plans now, so I'll zoom out and give you uh, a little bit uh, just a little bit better description of what we plan on doing. So as I had said, we'll be extending the canopy on the south side for an additional um, fuel dispenser and expanding the building. Uh, the original dumpster location was on the south side of the building uh, and in order to accommodate the parking uh, and the additional dumpster, we moved it to the other side uh, near the loading to provide one areas for deliveries and two, uh, a little bit easier for um, garbage trucks to get in there, get what they need, and then um, head out through the site, uh, through um, the north entrance. Um, the underground storage tanks will be replaced uh, with newer uh, double walled um, underground storage tanks. And the existing Gulf Station will be uh, demolished uh, and make way for additional parking and six um, EV charging stations. We're going to be maintaining, for the most part, um, the two uh, driveway entrances on the north side of the site and closing one uh, driveway entrance and basically maintaining uh, the third. Uh, that would be to really help. Uh, keep vehicles heading north on High Street from needing to enter the intersection. Um, and then uh, we will also be uh, redoing the canopy pad uh, just to kind of help with the existing uh, state of it. And, I, and also adding in uh, pedestrian access from the street, which doesn't exist today. Uh, I believe that's all I really have for the site improvements. Uh, I can get into more of the you know, utility designs and, and stuff like that if anyone needs me to cover that. Um, but that's essentially the, the project in a nutshell. Uh, so I'll open it up to any questions. Any, um, any immediate questions? So I know we have um, our peer reviewer did an extensive review of this project also, and we'll probably we'll go to that next. But uh, any any anyone any board members with their hands up? I'll hold my question until after the peer review is done. All right, um, Mr. Houston, you want to walk us through your report? Could I interrupt for a second? Before we get there, um, I do want to indicate that we received the peer report late last week. Um, I don't think at this point we're uh, ready to go through in, in detail everything that's in the peer report. Um, but um, I think it's um, important that Mr. Houston does speak about it. Um, and um, I'm not sure that we're ready to address every item that he has brought up, but, um, think, but we can address it to the best that we can tonight. And I think tonight, so we, we realize, so this is a complicated um, project and um, we expect that we're gonna have to continue this to the next uh, hearing. And again, we're under time constraints due to the, um, you know, the changing membership of the board and everything. So I would like, we want to try to, um, work through this as efficiently as, as possible. So I think tonight it's mainly about identifying all of the issues and concerns that uh, board members have, um, any, any questions that we can ask you so that you can come back at the next meeting, similar to what we just did with a complete uh, approvable, you know, something that addresses all those concerns. So that, so I would say for Mr. Houston, instead of if you could kind of hit the highlights of things and then we'll, that'll stimulate some discussion with board members, I think. Thank you. Let's see, did we, Abby, did we? Uh... Uh, Tom, Tom is here, Tom, can he? Yeah. My apologies, I didn't unmute. <laughs> Yeah, um, 
the site is in an aquifer district and it's also in a DEP zone two. So there are a lot of issues that arise from uh, the concerns about potential contamination from gasoline service in the aquifer district. There is ample protection offered by the uh, devices that the service industry have developed in terms of double wall tanks and that type of thing. And there's also extensive protection accorded by local regulations. But one thing that is sort of particularly significant, if you render uh, more than 15% of the land within the aquifer district impervious, that changes how you design the drainage. And the drainage was designed to recharge a small amount of runoff, but release approximately the same amount of runoff to the municipal system that the site currently does. Because it's in the aquifer district and because of the impervious materials, 100% of the runoff has to be held on site. So that is a, um, you know, a very significant change. A related issue, the applicant did submit um, a number of borings that were taken on the site, but none of the borings are within the limits of the infiltration area, at least as it's currently depicted. Now that may well change because to hold runoff on site, that's gotta get a great deal bigger. But right now we have no tests within the infiltration facility. And that's particularly critical because the infiltration facility is right on the border of a change in soil types from HSGA, which is very permeable, which would absorb a lot of infiltration, and an HSCC, which is much less permeable and wouldn't infiltrate runoff as well. So we need site-specific uh, testing at the area of the proposed infiltration, both to determine soil texture and infiltration and also to determine the elevation of seasonal high groundwater. So those are probably some of the very key issues here. Uh, we did a very extensive report. We're gonna be meeting with the applicant uh, this Friday and I'm, I'm confident we can work through these issues. Mr. Mr. Houston, um, could I, just an idea that I was having was, um, would it make a, would it be helpful to have permeable um, asphalt. So to, instead of using asphalt for the parking area to use a um, uh, like a gravel and um, plastic, um, like, I don't know what you what the trade name for it is, but do you know what I'm talking about? Like a uh, permeable um, pavement approach? I, I, to some extent, uh, permeable pavement is not compatible with the with the uh, service station use because if there is a spill, there is at that point uh, nothing to contain the spill. Uh, so I don't know that the primary vehicular pavement area should be permeable. There may be an opportunity, for example, to have the walkways uh, be a permeable either asphalt or a permeable uh, a block type pavement. But I think the majority of the on-site pavement probably should not be permeable. Are there anything else you want to anything else you want to highlight for us? <clears throat> well, again, there are a number of uh, special permits and authorizations related to the basic use and related to uh, the presence of the site uh, in the uh, Act for Protection District. Uh, and fundamentally, I think the the key issue on the site is um, uh, is stormwater. The other issue I think we probably want to think about is, is uh, traffic. Uh, the applicant, I think, did a very credible job uh, 
GPI did a very credible traffic analysis, but there are a few issues. Uh, one of them is that there is quite a difference uh, in terms of the impact of the project. If you use the town's required 4% per year background growth rate, that tends to deteriorate the levels of service of the intersections. The applicants engineer did an alternative analysis with a 1% growth rate, which is something like you see in Eastern Massachusetts over a rather extended period of time. But uh, I think that may be something the board members just want to keep in mind when they're reviewing the traffic analysis. There's kind of two approaches here. And uh, certainly the town has a right to prescribe the criteria uh, to do a traffic analysis, but there, uh, uh, there's quite a difference between the two different approaches that the traffic study uh, indicates. The other kind of key thing, I feel strongly that the traffic signal equipment, which is at the intersection of Gay Street and High Street, should be incorporated in the traffic analysis. I mean, fundamentally, when you do a traffic analysis, you usually look up and downstream on, on the main street to see what the nearest principal intersection is. Well, this intersection is only 300 feet away. I would anticipate that perhaps the signal uh, uh, at Hartford and the signal at Gay Street may already be interconnected. And uh, if they are, that's going to affect the analysis of intersection operations. And if they're not, I think as a minimum in terms of mitigation, that the two intersections should be analyzed as a coordinated pair. And if they're not coordinated, providing interconnection may be a reasonable mitigation uh, measure for this project. All right, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Houston. Um, Abby, do you wanna go over the other staff uh, items or the other from the other boards? And Sure, um, so we did have staff comments from the various departments. Um, the building commissioner did note that there is a um, special permits that were also needed from the Zoning Board of Appeals for the use um, for signage and for um, the water protection overlay district. And um, during that review, the um, water district would also review and provide comments to the zoning board. Um, our recommendation to the applicant was to get started here with planning board first. That way the planning board can give um, comments to the zoning board during their, um, their hearings uh, when those applications are submitted to the ZBA. Um, the fire department was looking for some more information. They had uh, asked some questions about um, the number of staff and um, providing um, turning templates. Um, the health director had also noted that um, there would need to be um, a permits through the Board of Health. Um, also, the, um, the amount of disturbance will require a permit, a land disturbance permit with the Conservation Commission, a public hearing with them. And then also um, the Pedestrian Bike Safety Committee, they had recommended um, extending, um, adding a little bit of a grass area and a bike rack next to the building. Um, so they had recommended, there's a um, handicapped parking space that was closest to the, the, uh, the uh, south side of the building. So they had recommended um, bumping that out a bit to um, include a grass area with maybe a bench and a bike rack. Um, and then that would also straighten out the crosswalk um, that it's at a diagonal right now. Um, so the committee had recommended that. And then there was one committee member had suggested a um, possibly closing that southernmost curb cut, the right turn in. Um, thought, didn't think there was a great need for that given the signal is so close. Um, that that could be closed and then there'd be less curb cuts and then there could be a, a couple of parking spaces added there. Um, so those are, those are all the staff comments. All right, thank you. Um, 
Let's go around and uh, who wants to go first? Mr. Path. Thanks. Um, yeah, a few questions and, uh, and comments. Um, first off, it was about 10 years ago, I think mobile um, renovated this site. Were the tanks changed at that time? I'm gonna to have to let Kevin uh, answer that, um, but I don't believe so. Okay. Um, next, uh, you, you know how much business is being generated by the mobile as it sits right now, I assume, right? I did visit the site, yes. <laughs> okay. How many, um, what's, what's the increase in expected trips into this location at full build? Here, do we know how many more cars we're attracting per day or at peak hours? Uh, Rebecca, yeah, so I can actually um, answer that for you. Um, actually, um, Zach, you should have in the package um, our slides mm -hmm. that shows the um, the trip generation comparison. My apologies, I I, I looked for it, I didn't see it. Sorry. Yeah, no worries. This one right here? Uh, nope, two more down. Got it. Yeah, so this slide is showing you um, the left-hand column there, that first column represents what the existing site is generating. And then the next column represents what the um, proposed facility would generate. Um, and then you can see on the right-hand side is the net increase in trips. and a number of those trips would be pass by in nature. So they would be traffic that's already on the adjacent roadway that would stop in on their way to somewhere else to get gas, pick up a soda, something like that. Um, and then the, um, the far right column represents the primary trips. So those would be the people who are coming here as a destination. Um, so the increase in trips that would be generated um, would be, um, 44 to 36 trips during any of the peak hours. Okay. Um, and the reason I ask that is I'm, I'm concerned uh, about, I, I tend to agree with uh, the uh, pedestrian and bike um, committee member about the need for that south uh, entrance. Um, it seems a little, um, superfluous <laughs> because you have an entrance. I understand what was articulated earlier was to, uh, that is to not force them to have to go through the intersection to turn right into, um, so I'm trying to assess, is it working now? And are the added trips going to make it much more difficult if you kept it at the two entrances uh, versus the three that you're proposing? Um, it seems, my gut tells me, that first one isn't necessary, that most people are gonna be coming to pump gas and they're gonna to wanna to enter closer to the gas fill-ups anyway. So they're gonna to wanna to go to the stoplight and go right. Um, I could be wrong there, but that's just my, my, my knee-jerk reaction. Um, my second thought is the electronic vehicle charging area, how, how long do cars, what's the average time it takes to recharge a car, how long are they there? I know it, like pumping gas, it obviously it depends on how much gas you're putting in. Are they, but so are like, are they level two? Are they fast charging stations or what's the idea there? Um, we, that has yet to be determined. Yeah. How did you arrive at six? Is it just the amount of space remaining? Or is that typical for a refilling station? of this size? It was basically the space that was allowed to get that many in there. Okay. They also have this at another, uh, a similar thing that we proposed uh, similar amounts to, so and they seem to be used. Well, uh, getting back to the idea of possibly removing that southernmost curb cut, um, it seems to me you could possibly, if you removed it, it would afford the opportunity for more uh, buffering landscaping. Uh, the neighboring property of the optometrist has grass 
between their parking lot and the sidewalk. And that might be an opportunity to, instead of having the ribbon of cement or concrete going through there, um, continue the grass over in front of your uh, mechanical or electronic boxes. Um, and I would like to see, I didn't see an elevation. I saw a landscape plan, but I couldn't discern from that the um, how, how high the boxes were and what kind of plants you were planning to put in front of it. Um, so it, it strikes me as an opportunity for some, some green space there, uh, continuing towards the optometrist office further south should the southern curb cut be removed and possibly a couple more electronic vehicle charging stations put in there in lieu of that. Uh, and that's, sorry, that's the only questions I had for right now. All right, and so uh, Mr. Gotti has his hand raised. Actually, if other folks use the hand raise button and then I will, I'll keep an eye on it this time. So go ahead, Mr. Gotti. Sure thing. Um, so point of clarification for uh, Ms. Brown, I just want to ask the incremental trips, is that based on the 2028 six year projection at the 4% at the 1% because it, and I have a sort of follow up question for Mr. Houston related to that. It seems like the traffic generation, yes, there's a spare delta between that four and 1%, but the incremental traffic from the build versus no build does not seem like it is that significant. So I just want to clarify your concerns around that. And then Chris, just related to the pedestrian bike safety committee, that was the uh, desire to have that third curb cut removed was the uh, desire of one member. The other members actually looked at that and said, that may provide an opportunity to increase the safety by creating a one-way flow if you use that as an entrance only so that the, uh, that the light you could get in at the far southernmost you could get in and then you use the northernmost as an exit only. So that would create a more predictable, safer flow than potentially having cars coming in from where you have the light and off of that southernmost entrance. So that was something that the Pedestrian Bike Safety Committee talked about fairly extensively. I, th I think that northernmost uh, one closest to Gay Street I, I don't, I think that has to be an entrance area for those area, those cars moving south on High Street. If you ask them to t take a left at that light, it's gonna cause problems with the traffic on High Street. Um, and if you ask them to take a left after the light into that southernmost, I think it's gonna create more problems. There's not gonna be many traffic breaks at peak, peak hours. So I think that Northern one has to remain two way. That's a, that's a fair point. I did, can I get an answer to the two questions related to the, Sorry, the traffic volume? That's a, no, it's, it's a fair point, Chris. Yeah, so I can answer the question about the traffic volume. So in terms of the um, the volume increase in traffic, um, you're correct. That doesn't change whether we're looking at four percent growth rate or one percent growth rate. That incremental increase in traffic is how much would actually be generated by the site. Um, the 1% and 4% um, increase in traffic that was talked about by Mr. Houston, that relates to the traffic that's actually out on Route 109 that's passing by the site. Um, and so if we use the 1% the per year growth rate, it's about an 8% growth that we're looking at over the seven year design horizon. But if we use a, a 4% per year growth rate, it's increasing that existing traffic on Route 109 by about 37%. What that does is it um, puts the intersection um, in some cases over capacity or right at capacity. So when we add our additional traffic on top of it, the impact becomes exponential at that point. So you do actually see some large increases in delay um, when you look at that 4% per year growth rate in comparison to when you look at the 1% per year, there's a lot of additional capacity at the intersection right now that is able to um, accommodate the traffic that's generated um, by the, the uh, redevelopment of the site. Um, but when you're looking at that 4%, that capacity or the intersection is already over capacity at that point. Um, so there isn't that ability to absorb the additional traffic. Um, I do think that that 37% over the seven years is, is an extremely high rate. 
Um, throughout the Commonwealth, we've been seeing rates typically around 0.5% per year, um, going up to about 1.5% on the higher end. Um, but um, the, the roads right around the site, based on historic traffic counts, have been increasing at about 0.8%, so a little under the 1% that we actually did use. Um, so we do think that that's a more reasonable number to use and that with that 1% growth, um, traffic can easily be accommodated. And Tom, you would, con you would concur with that? Yes, I mean, uh, if you look at the total trips that are generated by the project, they range from 200 to 250 an hour. Uh, it is correct that the increase in trips is in the 60 to 70 range. And of those trips, uh, you know, a third or so are pass by trips, meaning that their trips from vehicles that are already on the road going by the service station. So it's not attracting the full number of additional trips to that area. Many of the cars were already there. But uh, if you look at uh, what is the primary impact in terms of the intersection operations, uh, under the 1% uh, scenario, uh, the intersections operate quite well. Under the 4%, you have failure of the intersection in the morning and a relatively poor uh, level of service during the afternoon. And even the, the difference between no build and build now gets noticeable because of the background you're dealing with. The difference between the no build and build, even though the project isn't adding a huge amount of traffic, that adds 28 seconds of delay to the intersection, which is highly impactful. So, you know, the 1% the may be somewhat more realistic. I think the overall volume of traffic generated by the project is moderate and the increase is less than 100 trips during the peak hour. Thank you both. Yeah, I have, um, I have some questions unless there's other, someone else wants to go first. Um, could, you, uh, could you describe a little bit more about the, um, the nature of the business? It wasn't, um, like, cause it kind of informs how, what the activity level is gonna be. Cause I was, it's, it's, it's a gas station with a convenience store right now but based on the drawings and things it, to, and what I could find online about the All Town Fresh, it looks like this would be more of a, um, an organic foods market or something. And would there be like, uh, kind of, could you just kind of talk to like how it's gonna change the, um, uh, the activity and, and, and in, the, in there? Ryan, you wanna take this or you want me to take it? Can you hear me all right? Yes. Okay, <clears throat> so this is Kevin Doyle with Global Partners. Uh, basically, you are correct. Uh, this will become a all town fresh destination. And inside the store, we will have basically a made to order uh, kitchen that specializes in, as you can see on the tagline underneath the sign, organic, natural, gluten-free, a healthier option, healthier choices than your average convenience store. Uh, we are opening one a week from tomorrow in Eastern Mass. Um, everyone is welcome to swing by there and see that if they'd like or go on to the website and see the app, but it is a different type of food offering. So there'll be the food offering and there will also be your everyday convenience store items as well. But the basis of this is be able to provide the local residents, the neighborhood, and anyone who stops by uh, better food options and better choices. 
All right, thanks. Um, and then with the, so the EV charging stations, you said you hadn't decided which, uh, what types they would be. How is that, uh, but it does kind of, how does that fit into this, um, the traffic circulation? So if they're gonna be, um, if they're gonna be level two chargers, then you're looking, those typically can recharge about 25 miles per hour. Um, if they were fast charging, that'd be a situation where someone could park their car there for an hour and get it fully recharged. So I'm wondering, is that is the idea to attract um, people to come charge their electric vehicles or would they be just charging the vehicle while they are in the store? Because that's nope, this, is ju this is just an option that we're giving the consumer something else that we can give the consumer. There is no real driving force behind it, as we know electric car chargers and electric cars are becoming much more popular. And we don't wanna just be known as a uh, fossil fuel gasoline station. We wanna be able to give the consumer and the customer a little bit of everything. And uh, obviously with the food options in this new food service principle, electric car charging stations kind of fall right into the same thought process. Is there any table dining designed for this? No, not at this time. So is it uh, base? Is it um, ready to eat sort of takeout stuff? Is that the idea? You can place an order on an app and come in and pick it up the store. You can walk in the store and place an order and take it wherever you want to go with it. Because we know this. So our, some of our other sites, we have outdoor seating and we know outdoor seating is not allowed here. And we do have some sites that have indoor seating, but right now all the indoor seating has been taken away based on COVID restrictions. All right, uh, Mr. McCusker has his hand raised, so. Thank you. Uh, I have several questions for different people. Um, for the developer, the existing tanks at 722, are they gonna be removed and soil tested? That's the Gulf Station, yes. Everything will be removed from that site and properly disposed of and the site will be, and all soil will be tested. Okay. Um, you're going to be offering at the Gulf Station offered car service, repair service. You won't be offering any car repair service on site? That is correct. We will not. Okay. Uh, and as far as the curb cuts, for me, we'd have to get it down to two curb cuts. Um, and I would suggest leaving the, the center with the light uh for southbound traffic to access the property in the northernmost curb cut uh now i have a question for uh mr houston you with us mr houston i am sir uh as far as storm water management goes i see in your report you have 16 light items just under storm water management is that correct that's probably correct. I didn't count them, but yes. And correct me if I'm wrong, from what I understand you're telling me is that because of the new impervious uh, surfaces that is going to cr be created by this expansion project, you're saying we're going to move into a higher tier of stormwater management that the current system was not designed for. That is correct. The zoning bylaw requires that. And so you're telling us that at this very moment, it was still at the stage of we're going to have to do soil testing to just to find the right conditions on the site before we can design a new stormwater system. That is correct. Do you think something like this can be accomplished in three weeks? It would be challenging to do soil testing in that period of time, yes. Depends on their ability to get it. First of all, it depends on how they're going to do it, whether they're gonna do it with a backhoe or a boring rig. And it depends on how long it takes them to mobilize that. You could uh, design based upon an assumed condition and verify it uh, prior to construction with test pits taken at that time, but there's obviously the risk that your assumptions may not be verified by the actual conditions observed. 
Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, I think we should uh, inquire of the applicant if they feel confident moving forward with only three weeks left of the session for this current board. Yeah, did um, Ms. Devereaux, you look like you were gonna say something or no? Yeah. No, I was gonna um, ask Zach to address that because a lot of this is really engineering um, based as um, member McCusker um, uh, stated. Uh, yeah, so um, because of the time sensitive nature of trying to get this um, before you and approved, uh, we did have some previous boring data and monitoring well data from you know the early 2000s, which is what we used in order to supplement and design our system. Uh, we were hoping to be able to move forward with the assumptions like Mr. Houston had suggested, and then prior to construction, confirm that our assumptions are correct, and if not, um, adjust accordingly. Uh, obviously, letting the town know and you know resupplying uh, any any design materials. Um, so that was our intent. Uh, we didn't uh, think we were going to be able to get testing done in order in this time frame. In this tight time frame, uh, as Mr. Houston again, he stated like three weeks is is difficult is a difficult time frame to spin. Um, so that was our plan to to move forward with the assumptions as they are uh, and confirm before construction. Well, I think. Um it would be wise to look at our history of um, the stormwater requirements are always something that we are very strong about. And um, as we looked at the Audi uh, Mazda dealer conversion and had them go back and do that and the Mercedes dealer. And so there's always, um, it's something that, and from our last hearing too, you could see we want to know what's gonna be done and verify it. Um, so I think that's, um, it's, it would be unlikely that we would have a blank check from the planning board, you know, or it has to be something where it's very, uh, uh, where there's a commitment, um, you know, where it's a, almost a contract, you know, like it's not uh, up to the discretion of the uh, staff to approve it or something. Um, can I ask uh, Mr. Question? Chairman, if I may just offer a comment. The reason that you would test is twofold. You want to know the permeability of the soil and you want to know the depth to groundwater. Although there are no tests right where the infiltration facility is currently proposed, the depth to groundwater in the borings is pretty consistent and it's pretty deep. So I think I have less of a concern about the depth of seasonal high groundwater as opposed to the permeability at the location. And my Concern there is simply the fact that it's near a change in soil type, but proceeding with the assumptions they have is fine. They could design a system, but there is the risk that prior to construction, when everything is verified, if the permeability of the soil is measurably less, that means that the size of the infiltration facilities would have to significantly increase. They're gonna to have to increase anyway, because there's a big difference between releasing a lot of the runoff, which is the current plan, and holding 100% of it on site. And there's no way around that uh, in terms of the zoning bylaw, you just have to do that. So the system is gonna get bigger anyway, but it could get a whole lot bigger if the soil type isn't correct and we're in the sea soil where the permeability is lower. Um, Abby, did you, uh, did you wanna? Sorry, I, um, I wanted to add that we have, um, we have in the past, um, applicants have designed based on the assumptions. Um, and so that the peer review would still review revised plans based on these assumptions. And then if approved, what we've done in the past is there would be a condition that the um, soils be tested to, um, you know, based on be tested and resubmitted back to the town to um, verify the assumptions. If there were changes, 
if, if it didn't work out, if the soil didn't work, then there would be a mod a modification to the system would have to a modified plan would have to come back to the planning board. But so is that something we could handle as a um, if we um, is that something that would be a continuation? Would we have the same issue with the composition of the board, or would we be able to have a modification request to the new board that handled that? I think it would be a new. You know, you could um, review revised plans, revised designs at your next meeting, vote on it then, and then include a condition that the soils testing be submitted um, to verify the assumptions. That would be a condition. And then if a modification were needed, that could go, go forward at a, um, at a, a, new, board, a new board. Okay. Uh, questions. Um, let's see, I don't see any other hands. Ms. Kona, do you have any any questions? Nope. Uh, let's see. All right, so let's let's move to the um, to the public comment portion of this. And um, so we have uh, we have some Q and A. We have some hands raised. And so generally, the approach I'm taking here is to recognize the people who are gonna speak. So the people who have their hands raised first and um, to come and we'll come back to the, the Q and A as well. So in the, um, the, the attendees here, two hands are raised and I believe that Jennifer Berry had her hand raised first. So I will hand the mic to her. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. And can you just um, with your name and your address? Um, my name is Jennifer Berry, and I lived at 26 Edgewood Road for many years. Um, and um, I wanted to inquire about the service, uh, the um, repair shop at the Gulf. Um, it, it looks as if in the plans, it's not there anymore. Um, and I wanted to, you know, I wanted to inquire as to um, why it's not included. I, the, I've been going to that repair shop for many, many years. It's been there for a very long time. Um, it's a big part of the community. Many There are many customers that go there. The town relies on it. There's a very honest mechanic who owns it. And um, it's a little dismaying to see that it's it's not part of the plans. It's kind of being tossed aside. There's, you know, it has roots in the community. Um, and there's a person who it's their livelihood also. So um, I'm just, I'm wondering why it's not a part of the plans uh, because it is a big benefit to the town and to the surrounding area. Right. Thank you, Jennifer. Did, um, can we confirm? I think it was a board member asked about that earlier, but just put the, what's the status for that? Uh, yeah, sorry. Um, this is, uh, yeah, the intent is for that service station to no longer be in service uh, to make room for the expanded uh, footprint of the All Town Fresh so that they can uh, make their brand a little bit uh, more noticeable and prominent in this town. All right. Um, I'll, the next person I see a hand raised is Joelle Driscoll. Joanne, you should be able to, we should be able to hear you now if you speak. Yes. Hi, Joelle Driscoll. I'm at 41 Russell Ave. Um, my house is directly behind the mobile, the mobile gas station. And I want to start first by saying mobile has been a fabulous neighbor. They've accommodated any issues we've ever had. They're just really great. So I look forward to that relationship continuing. I did have a couple of questions though. The first one, um, the market itself, looking at other markets, um, the express, I mean, the um, fresh markets, how, will the height of the market increase? Because it, it almost seems like it's like a story and a half at other fresh markets. That would be my first question. The other is 
there's a fence that goes behind the mobile station. I wanted to know if that fence would continue down behind the former Gulf station as well. And the third thing I wanted to ask is when you um, demolish the Gulf station, it looks like you'll push back a little bit from the existing plans. Um, I would hope that if you were to take down trees, you would then replace trees um, as well so that there's still a good amount of um, barrier for both the sound and the light. And the fourth issue, the fourth question I would like to bring up is right now there's paths that go behind these stations and they um, go through and end up at the middle school as well as the high school. So there's a lot of um, children that go back and forth and it's great to see the kids out and about and walking through the woods. The one drawback is there is so much trash. It's really disgraceful that it, it's not mobile. It's not golf. I understand that, but there it, there's broken glass. There's piles of trash and it's not just behind the stations, it continues through the path. So if there's any way that you may be able to put out additional receptacles for trash to help with that problem, I'd appreciate it. And that's all. So if you, anyone could answer those questions, great. And thanks again. I hope we continue to have a great neighbor. All right, thank, thank you, Joel. You wanna, Zach, you wanna tackle those one by one? Yeah, yeah, I wrote them down so I didn't forget any. Um, first, thank you too for for um, saying how well the relationship has been so far. It's, it's great to hear. Um, for the height of the building, this will stay the one story. Um, other buildings, they do. Uh, you did reference uh, other other sites that have the all town fresh. They do look the newer buildings. Um, they are a little bit taller. They have a little bit more presence, but this will remain um, the one story. Uh, as far as the fence in the back, that fence right behind the building will be staying as is. Uh, our intent is to basically stop at the back of the building. We're, I think we're proposing a really small sidewalk to kind of help get access to the rear uh, doors of the building, but that fence should be staying as is. Um, the, there aren't currently any trees being proposed to be replaced, we, but that there is, I've been to the site and in the portion of the parking area that we are replacing, um, uh, sorry, in the portion of the parking area that we're extending, uh, that's where the site gets really deep and that's pretty wooded. So we weren't initially intending uh, to plant any trees out there um, and screening could be an option. Um, I was unaware of any paths through the back of the site, but I, I don't think it would be an issue to add a few trash receptacles um, either before uh, probably right at the entrance uh, to these paths on our site. Um, just to, one, make it a little bit easier for it to be emptied uh, by uh, the employees and two, at least uh, we'll have one in there for people coming and going through there. All right. I think I, I, think I got them all. Thank you. Uh, any other, anyone else with their hand raised on Zoom? I don't. Yes, there's one more. Uh, let's see, where's that? No, they are no longer. All right, I see no other hands raised. Ah, oh, Scott is trying to raise his hand. Okay. Scott, if you can identify your name and address and um, you have the mic. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. All right, my name is Scott Davenport. Uh, thank you for your time. I'm uh, next door at 692 High Street. Uh, the Davenports. We uh, have been a neighbor of 710 for uh, since 19, let's see, 1955. So my concerns are, first of all, the ground water is high there. I can tell you because we have four sump pumps in the basement there. <laughs> So I know that the groundwater is high over there. Um, 
as well, one of my concerns is um, the tank location. Um, back in the 80s, they tore down the gas station and moved it over to where my building is. They're, I don't know how many feet they're from the lot line, but uh, back in 2000, uh, because I have a report here that was done from uh, Exeter Environmental Group, because back in 2011, there was a leak. Uh, they were dumping a load of gasoline and the elbow pump uh, came off the trailer and it went into the ground. And uh, we weren't notified until I got a call from Mr. Scoble telling me that there was vapors in my building and that they had to evacuate it. And the vapors went not only to 692, but they went all the way over to Tony and Tanelis's place. So the ground under there, if you look at this report, it's, it's sand and cobble. And the, and the water runs down from Lyman's and it runs down, and this is drinkable water, right? This is running, this is supposed to be drinkable water. So my concern is the location of the tank. Uh, how would they handle a situation like that? The other concern that I have with you guys is that they're gonna put food in there. And uh, I would be concerned about the trash and, and the critters that are gonna, how they're gonna handle that of, uh, you know, mice and whatever from the Lyman's Pond has plenty of environmental animals over there that we don't want to impact. And uh, other than that, I'm, I'm more concerned about the ground. You know, they're going to dig those tanks up and put new tanks in? Is that the plan? Because they, they're talking about taking more, the gulf tanks out, but they haven't said anything about the tanks at, six, at, at 710. You know, what's going to happen with those? Are they... I think there's three tanks there, if I'm correct, uh, in the ground now, and they're showing two on the plan. And the other thing is, is how far is that parking lot going to come to my building? Is that going to come closer to the building? Zach, so I have a lot of concerns. <laughs> Zach, I can address the issue with the tanks. Those tanks will be replaced with new double wall fiberglass tanks. Uh, when that spill happened, um, they did not have what we now call double wall um, spill containment manholes on the tanks. So the new tanks will, they actually, they probably, but the existing have probably been retrofitted with those since then. But when those tanks come out, as per the DEP, we will remove as much soil as possible under their guidance and their direction. But those tanks on the mobile site will be replaced. And as the same with the Gulf, when we take the Gulf down, those tanks will be removed and, uh, you know, environmental impact study will be done. We have our own environmental people and we have outside consultants as well that will oversee the removal of both sets of tanks at the site. And the, uh, the Gulf tanks, so they're just gone, right? They'll be removed because there's no more Gulf station. That's correct. They'll be taken out completely. Anything uh, else? Zach, did you have anything else there? Uh, and just uh, uh, he had asked about the parking and how close it was to the building. We're uh, a little bit closer, um, but not much closer uh, than the existing parking area is right now. Uh, and the vents will be moved further away as well for the USTs. All right, uh, thank you. Thank you, Scott. Um, we have another hand raised, um, Mr. Giordano. Hi, Phil Giordano, 20 French Street. I just have a quick question. Uh, what kind of historical data exists for prior conversions of all town facilities to all town fresh facilities? And I'm especially curious regarding the length of stay that you may be anticipating. Is it uh, how long do you expect the increase to be and the number of trips that you would expect when there is a conversion to All Town Fresh? The All Town Fresh brand is a very new brand for the applicant. And we are just currently in the process of converting three sites, two in Massachusetts and one in Connecticut. So I'll be honest with you, I don't think we'd have any type of 
analytical data or history data that we could tell you or give you uh, those type of numbers. But All Town Fresh has only been around for, I think, four years now. The first one was uh, completed in Plymouth, Mass. All right, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Doyle. Um, any other hands raised? I thought I saw a hand. But I do not see any other hands raised. So let me take a look at the uh, Q&A. Um, let's see. So I'll start, um, let's see. Justin says, I'm a little sentimental, but this is an excellent plan. I can't wait. Will the mobile be open during construction? I'll just read through. Uh, Elaine Dorena says, this appears to be a large gas station and market more appropriate for Route 1 than for High Street, which is a congested two lane center of town road. How will this impact the residents of High Street and those traveling through town? I live on Hartford Street and it's already challenging to enter High Street due to the traffic flow from the current gas station and the two existing strip malls. What are the considerations for increased entering exit traffic? Uh, there is an average of 8,000 cars traveling Hartford Street as determined in a traffic study two years ago. That is a significant amount of traffic to consider. Uh, vehicles using the exit currently located across from Hartford Street prohibit the traffic flow and cause delays for traffic entering High Street from Hartford. Is the proposed exit for the new project in the existing location across from Hartford Street? And uh, I, Jennifer spoke and said what she has in the q and I believe. So it, it, would anyone like to respond uh, to the to any of the traffic or um, any, anything that was raised there. All right, uh, so that's, that's all the Q&A comments. There's no other people with their hands raised. Uh, so we'll go back to uh, board member discussion. Anyone, what are, what are your thoughts? Anyone wanna start this off? Excuse me, do you want um, the traffic, Rebecca Brown, to um, address the questions? Yes, if you have, uh, if you can address those, that would be great. Yeah, it sounded like most of those um, were kind of covered in, in our discussions already about the additional increase in traffic and what impact that would have. Um, I know there was some discussion about, um, I'm not sure exactly what her comment was in relation to Hartford Street and traffic not being able to access? Um, let's see if I would recognize her if she wants to speak. I could also, the situation, uh, yes. So Elaine has um, raised her hand. So can we allow her to talk and you can give your name and address and. Yes, hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, I live at 221 Hartford Street. Um, so uh, we have quite a bit of traffic on Hartford and a traffic study was done two years ago and it was determined there was an average of 8,000 cars per day entering or using Hartford Street, coming from Medfield, going to Medfield. So um, when you're driving up Hartford and you're at the stoplight, going on to High Street, it's already very congested. And then the traffic coming out of the current mobile all town station, you have to stop and let that traffic go a lot of the times. And it just holds up traffic on Hartford. And when the world opens up again, that traffic will be snaked down all the way to my house at 221 with the school buses and then the all town and mobile entering and exiting traffic, it's very congested. So my question was, um, currently, the exit and entrance to the uh, station is across from Hartford Street, where Hartford Street enters High Street. Is that going to be the location for the proposed expanded um, station and market? Yes, so the, um, the proposed, um, so the existing driveway that's located directly opposite of Hartford Street. 
that driveway will remain as a main access point for the all town. Um, and then the existing driveway that's further to the north um, on High Street, that will also be um, slightly modified, but will still be a full access and egress um, driveway in and out of the site as well. Um, and then there is also currently proposed a right turn in driveway that would be just south of Hartford Street on High Street. Um, but yes, we are planning to keep that signalized driveway that's directly opposite from Hartford Street. Okay, so will the Hartford Street traffic be considered then? I mean, have you considered currently in, in your studies, the Hartford Street traffic entering onto High Street? We did. So we um, collected traffic counts back in August of 2019. So they were actually collected pre-COVID conditions. Um, so they're um, in keeping with historic traffic volumes prior to COVID. Um, and they included traffic that was on Hartford Street and on Route 109 um, at the, the two um, driveways that currently exist into the mobile. Um, so we did include that in our analysis and we did analyze the Hartford Street um, approach to that intersection as well. Um, we were showing that um, with that 1% that per year growth rate that we talked about, um, a slight increase in delay on Hartford Street um, as a result of the additional traffic that would be in conflict with it coming out of the, um, the all town, it was about an increase of up to two seconds per vehicle of delay coming out of that. So um, relatively minor increase. I know one thing that was brought up um, already by the peer review consultant, Mr. Houston, was the idea of, of the coordination of the two intersections with Gay Street. Um, as part of our response to comments, we will be looking at that. Um, those intersections are coordinated today. So we'll look at whether some timing changes um, could help to alleviate some of the situation um, and we'll be considering Hartford Street in there as well. Thank you. What about um, what about the timing of um, so the, the um, all town fresh so the, the sort of the for the new services that are being offered are they always is that like from 7 a.m. or all day because the issue I think is that the um, you have certain times a day when it's it's really bad, and so you'll have cars already lined up uh, from that intersection all the way down Hartford Street and all the way down High Street. So if the additional, if the change of um, what's being done at the gas station happens um, right now, that happens around 8 a.m. to uh, 9 a.m. on weekdays and uh, noon to 5 p.m. on Saturdays. Uh, in pre-COVID times, it was from 6 a.m. to uh, 10 a.m. on and all. So I'm just wondering if the does that change your calculations at all? Kind of taking into account the type of business that's going to be going on there. Yeah. So when we do the trip generation, we do look at kind of a change in use. So obviously, the two existing facilities. Um, there's the the golf service station and the existing all town that is um, very convenience focused. So um, when we look at changing the site, we also looked at um, a different land use code, um, which is actually known as a super convenience store. Um, so that typically has the food service type of use. So we do look at that um, to be able to estimate what the change in traffic would be during those peak hours. Um, as related to the change in use too. So it's not just kind of a straight line comparison of what's out there today to what um, what the increase in square footage or something would be. Okay, I'm just I'm just saying it would make a big difference if um, the, um, you know, if the, if part of the, if the business was, if it's all like from 7 a.m. on or if the food's not typically, if that isn't really something people do in the morning, I don't know, that's. Uh, but I'll go to Mr. Gotti has his hand raised. Yeah, thanks, Dave. Um, two questions. One is if we're if we're taking any, you know, uh, the 109 Gay Street intersection into consideration, that the light coordination really needs to extend right over to the, the library as well because that's a very short distance. Those three lights need to be coordinated. But the the bigger concern that I have to sort of build on Elaine's point 
is the timing of the actual traffic study. Um, this town tends to empty out in August. Um, I can tell you that there's, you know, it's significantly down volume wise. So using August as our baseline, do we have any other studies that were done in a September, October or any, you know, April, May timeframe when things are truly at their peak? Um, I believe that, you know, this traffic study may be understated by a, a pretty decent proportion. Yeah, we can take a look at that to see um, what other data is available. Um, we did um, look at mass DOT seasonal adjustment factors. Um, typically, we would adjust traffic volumes to an average uh, month condition. And what we found was that in the surrounding area, um, August was actually consistent with an average month. Um, so some months are a little higher, some are a little bit lower, but August was pretty consistent with that average um, condition. But we can see what other data is available um, from counts in the surrounding area that were done while school was in session. I, I would suggest that we do that. I can tell you that if you were to ask any restaurateur in this town what August is like relative to their other months, they would tell you that is their low month of the year. Uh, Mr. Path. Yeah, um, throughout all this discussion, I, I was recalling uh, when Rob and I uh, talked about that northernmost curb cut, and uh, I still believe it needs to be uh, access uh, and uh, entrance and, and exit. But as if memory serves me, I believe that right there, there becomes coming north on 109, a left turn lane to allow left turns into the high street market area so having done this left turn into the gas station before i think there's a feeling of i'm in the wrong lane um i'm, I'm in an area that i don't belong trying to turn into that and i was just wondering about possibly restriping 109 if that uh, north curb cut is going to remain to allow for dual left turns um, at least at that point at the uh, entrance of of the mobile um, that's the sense I always got taking a left there that I was cross, not only crossing traffic, but I'm in, I'm in the other oncoming left turn lane so that I'm allowing cars to go past me and I'm not blocking traffic trying to make a left-hand turn. So I'm wondering if they could speak to, have they discussed that? Have they looked into that behavior of drivers? Uh, we haven't to date um, analyzed that type of situation. Um, I do agree with you that that may be helpful, though. Um, really, that left turn lane is kind of longer than it needs to be um, for the, the signal at Gay Street. And I think it was striped that way to be able to provide that left turn um, into the plaza as well at their southerly driveway. Um, but I think that that's, that's a very good comment. And I think that two-way left turn lane out there could help a lot. So we can take a look at that to see um, whether that's something that could fit. And in the idea, I know I mentioned earlier about the southernmost curb cut being eliminated. Uh, if it could be demonstrated that it would truly aid in uh, not just an option, but if, that it would be used. I know, maybe, you know, you don't have a crystal ball, but um, either for safety, as Mr. Gotti mentioned, or for actual uh, traffic dispersion. Um, I, I, I could revisit that, but I still remain that I, I think most people um, going to all town currently are going to continue to turn right going northbound on 109 um, at that intersection of Hartford Street. Um, it's, it's a more direct entrance to where they want to go to the pumps or even to the store. Um, they may change behavior if they're going to the store and, and use the parking by the EV um, parking spaces. But um, I don't know, it just seems, uh, I, I said it before, I, it just seems a, a bit overkill. Um, but again, if it can be demonstrated that it would help for safety and indoor traffic, then I'd be happy to revisit that position. All right. Um... Any other, any other questions? All right, let's uh, see what we, it sounds like, um, would anyone like to summarize some key points here? Abby, do you wanna? Oh, 
I just noticed there's a um, hand another hand raised in the um, from the public comment. Oh yes. Um, all right. I will. Um, the Feeney family. Let's uh, recognize them. Hi, Sharon Feeney, Russell, uh, 30 Russell Ave. I am concerned, number one, we have a very high water table here. So the ground testing would be very important. Um, we all have pumps, at least two pumps going all the time, all year round, off of Russell Ave. It um, used to be a quarry up here. And we back up to Lyman's Pond. The other thing is 109 is the third busiest secondary road in Massachusetts. The study, like Rob said, done in August, it's a ghost town here in August. So you, re you really re re need, you need to revisit that part of the study. I am concerned because one of my children got waxed by a car go cutting into Starbucks. You have Starbucks, then you have the um, eye doctor, now you're gonna have all town. That's a lot of traffic in the morning on 109. And I am a former crossing guard in the town, so I know about the traffic. So I am kind of concerned. Um, you know, the, I know that extra driveway where the Gulf is, that might help, but I'm not sure. I think you need to really see the plans, adding a third driveway there. And as far as Elaine said, the traffic coming out of 10, you get a gridlock there when the traffic coming up High Street and they have light. The light at 109 at Gay Street and Hartford Street are timed in the morning. I can come out of Gay Street and I get stuck at the light at Hartford Street. Okay, so they are timed and in the afternoon it's worse. The traffic on 109 on Gay Street, it's all the way back past Deerfield Ave. So this is your busy traffic times that you really got to think about. So those are some concerns I have. There's a lot of kids that visit mobile in the afternoon um, now that school's back in session. So I'm concerned about someone really getting hurt if these lights aren't uh, possibly a, a center lane versus a left lane, like they have in some towns, they have the center lane. There was talk a few years ago about 109 being widened from the middle school all the way down to Gay Street. Is that a possibility to incorporate in this project? So those are a couple of concerns I have, you know, walking the area and um, doing traffic on the area. So. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, any other any other comments, questions? It sounds like our one of the major things clearly the stormwater issues. Uh, and there are a lot of traffic and safety issues here. Abby, do you have anything from our, uh, anything else from based on staff comments or? Um, nothing additional except for, um, I think we heard from two board members that were interested in, in um, having only two curb cuts. I don't know if the other board members wanna weigh in on, on that um, southernmost entrance. I actually believe that it will help with traffic mitigation and could help with safety. So I'm I'm less concerned about eliminating that third curb cut. Yeah, I'm, I initially I was thinking I was supporting eliminating it, but um, it's it might help. Um, Ms. Kona, do you have any thoughts on? No, I agree with uh, Robin and yourself that that might help. Um. Let's see, so we need to provide some guidance for coming what they come back with. And I think, um, does anyone wanna throw out some bullet points of things they'd like to see for the next meeting? Let's not all speak at once here, but I think we've kind of gone over like, so the stormwater issues, number one, the uh, design of, it sounds like, uh, uh, Mr. Cusker, what did you think about the uh, the third curb cut? Uh, I am against the third curb cut. I think the most southerly curb cut 
it's going to the only people who are ever going to use it. The people are going to be going southbound, which means they'll have to cross to cross over northbound traffic without the benefit of lights. Anyone else going north is going to uh, get themselves over through the property of the all town and take the northerly most curb cut out, especially during times of traffic. To hopefully, maybe get themselves ahead of some of that traffic. I think the third curb cut is going to create more havoc than we need. That's my personal opinion. Can I just my clarify one thing on that third curb cut? So the, the southerly most curb cut is proposed to be a right turn in only. Um, so people wouldn't be allowed to take a left turn in or um, exit from that southerly driveway. And it's really intended to alleviate traffic um, at the signal itself to allow people to slip in there be without having to go through the signal um, to improve the delay there and to give them direct access into the parking for the convenience store um, for the all town without having to um, go through the, the fuel pumps area. So it reduces the congestion on site near the fuel pumps and through that traffic signal. Yeah, so you're not, if you're coming from the south, it's uh, you won't have to wait for the light to turn into the uh, all town. If you're leaving the all town, you're not supposed to use, you wouldn't be able to use that at all. So you have to go out either through the, uh, the way it is right now, basically, is how you have to go out. And that's the conflict that I think is the most challenging is at the light because every morning you see cars uh, trying to figure out how to how to stack themselves effectively to get in line there and it only takes one or two to block it so i mean i think um that sort of helps me solidify the idea that this, having the three curb cuts is good for me mr uh, chairman if i could just offer an opinion i think it's pretty standard practice to have a right hand in turn like that because you're sort of alleviating a bit of the congestion at the signal itself. If you can get a few cars not passing through the signal, that's probably that much the better. I'd be concerned if left-hand turns were allowed in, but where it's a right-hand turn only, that's a pretty low conflict type of movement. I think it's, from a purely traffic point of view, I think it's probably preferable, but obviously there may be other concerns like wanting more landscaping and that type of thing. But just from a traffic point of view, I think you're probably better off with it. And so no, um, so having like the three lane center, the center lane that can go both ways, that couldn't be extended that far. Like you, so we would not allow someone to, who's going southbound to turn left at the Gulf station. That is correct. Only people who are northbound would be able to slip in there so they don't have to wait for the light to clear. That's the current plan and I would recommend leaving it that way. So that means the only way a southbound 109 driver will be really able to get in there is on the north northernmost curb cut. Because turning left at that light there is problematic for traffic and also um, just making the turn itself. That's where there's more cars right at the light. So um, I think the only way to enter would be at that northernmost curb cut from a, a practical perspective. And so Chris, is that what you're, you're thinking like uh, using the existing left turn lane into, um, into the plaza there that if that could be made into a, um, into a both, you know, two way. Yeah. Yeah, people uh, get and I think we have those. We I think we have that somewhere else, maybe in front of Kiara, or I can't remember where. It seems like we have that, but um, it seems right now having that's how I get to All Town if I if I go, and I always feel like I'm in the wrong place. I, I know there's no other place for me to go unless I want to block traffic, but I have to kind of move over so the traffic can go behind me and it continue on 109. Because if you if you try to make a left turn, then you're going to have people. You're you're not going to make very many friends, right? No, but that's <laughs> no, your only way. Into a left turn, it, it's a left signal that gets you into the parking lot. There is a left turn signal on that center 
uh, in front of Hartford Street that brings you into the parking lot. But that's it's a one lane road there, isn't it? It is. I'm sorry. It's one. It, it's one lane. So if you're waiting, you've got a line of cars behind you trying to get in at that light at Hartford Street, trying uh, to take a left into Mobile. Well, I believe they can get around you. From my, from what I remember, you they can get around you, but it's Isn't a. Is there an island on the right? There's an island to the right that designates left uh, the two lanes of uh, Hartford Street. Hey, Dave. Just question here. Um, you know, in the interest of this, how much of this is the applicant's, you know, problem to solve versus the town's traffic issue, right? I mean, I think if we have the right turn only on the northbound side, um, then you're, I guess, is that northbound or southbound? I forget. Um, but on the side headed to 128, headed to Gay Street, if that does create, to Tom's point, some mitigation, some, you know, relief of the traffic congestion. The rest of this is an issue today as it exists. Yes, it will be exacerbated a little bit by the incremental trips, but this is an issue with the traffic as it exists today. And I, I don't know how much of that we can put on these guys to solve. Right, I think it's the um, overall, it's sort of evaluating whether that third curb cut is a net benefit. And so it sounds like it probably could help. Uh, so then what remains in terms of things that, um, is there any other, are there any other issues that, um, that we needed to address related to the overall application here? The only other thing that I recall from the pet bike folks was a desire to have that um, crosswalk go straight to the curb versus into what is currently the um, exit area for a handicap accessible vehicle. Um, they had some concerns about that. So that was the only other thing that my recollection from attending their meeting. Yeah, I would, I would agree with, uh, with that. It's, and, and remember, and as someone pointed out on the phone, and as I know from my own experience here, like there will be a lot of kids that are, uh, they're walking there. So it, either through the woods or up the sidewalk. So it should be, Whenever you have those like 45 degree crosswalks across the parking lot is not an ideal. So if you can make that a 90 degree connection, uh, that's better. Uh, Mr. Chairman, if I could just mention one thing, I think it's essential in terms of figuring out whether we can proceed here. Is it going to be acceptable to proceed with the drainage design based upon the data we have to be verified prior to construction, because it looks like it is not practical to actually do the required testing in the short period of time that we have. Did uh, anyone want to jump in? I, I have thoughts about that, but Mr. Abby, Abby mentioned that we have uh, precedence um, for having done that. Abby, are you able to recall the the uh, the projects. No, but it, but it is common. Um, I mean, they still have to design their plans based on these assumptions. But I I don't remember off the top of my head. But it is a pretty common um, condition that you do impose that you re, you know you review the proposed um, drainage plans, but it is based on an assumption. And then there's a condition that um, those assumptions are, are verified um, either by submitting back to staff or having the peer review um, take a look at that. So that is um, common. I mean, I, I can think of, I know we did that at 80 Wilson Way, and then they did have to come back to modify um, based on their assumptions. but. Um, but, but very oftentimes it doesn't, it, it comes back, it's checked and they can proceed with their plans as designed. Okay. And so I think earlier we talked about like we could craft, we could craft a decision that, um, so let's say worst case scenario. Um, so we, we approve it based on the data we have at the time. Um, and then it comes back as, uh, the test results reveal that they're going to need to construct you know, a $50 million thing to solve this. And so then they would be like, well, we can't, 
move forward. It wouldn't just be like, oh, well, okay, the, it's, the project is approved and all. So we would, I think we would have a, we would have to have a, a modification request. And like the, the risk would be that it was impossible, you know, that, so then we, we go to the modification request and we say, well, we can't give a modification that is waiving everything, you know, just saying, oh, well, too bad, you know, can't do it. So that that's the risk on them is that they discover that it's physically impossible to meet the bylaw requirements of the stormwater. I think, I think, yeah, I think that's a fair point, Dave. I think Tom's question is the right one though, because this is a critical path item regarding how we and they can move forward, right? Because of the impending change of the board. So I think if that's the path forward and the applicant is comfortable with that risk, um, then which they must be because that they were using those assumptions to begin with, then I think we have precedent for a path forward. All right, do we have, uh, it sounds like we have, we have something here. So um, do we, is there, is there anything from the applicant, any questions from you to help that you need further clarification from us on? Uh, I just, um, so one of the reasons, just because the drainage is, uh, is a big topic now, um, I was just curious about uh, the size of the system we had, already met with the town and I had posed the question uh, when we do come in with storm water um, do we have to meet the uh, the uh, stormwater standards as outlined by the Massachusetts stormwater manual which is what we, we did um, and it was the 15 I guess the 15 percent uh, impervious coverage that's making us recharge this all on site, uh, that's very, very drastic and, and personally, in my opinion. Um, so I was just wondering if there is any leeway, if we do find out that this system is gonna have to be massive uh, in order to maintain um, all of the recharge on site, is there a point where it becomes okay to uh, basically show you what is what we're proposing and say it's you know we're meeting all the way up to 75 percent and we're still discharging to the site it's a much better improvement to what's currently there is there a point where uh, we have to hit obviously we're going to try and hit 100 percent um, retained on site uh, but if that becomes a system that is you know 50 percent to site um, I was just curious, is it all or nothing is basically well, my question. Tom, can you um, can you address it? But I mean, I would just say from a, the perspective of we have to meet our MS4 requirements and um, we're not going to approve something that we know is going to flood people's basements. So it's, uh, what are your, Tom? What are well, your you, you could design a system that meets MS4, it meets the Massachusetts stormwater standards and all that type of thing and still have some release of runoff to the MS4 system. It really is a zoning issue. And the way I read the zoning bylaw, it's an all or nothing type of thing. So I would think if you are not gonna comply with the requirement to recharge 100% on site, that's zoning relief from the ZBA that I would characterize as a variance. So it, it wouldn't be, it's not relief, I think, that this board can grant, but they'd have to go to the ZBA and determine why relief was desirable in this case. All right. Um, any further any further questions or comments? Let me see if there's anything else. All right, I see no other comments and also I guess at this point we would be looking to continue this to our April 26 meeting if someone would like to make a motion to that effect. So moved. I think you have to identify the time. And I'd like to continue this EIDR uh, public hearing 
710 to 722 High Street to Monday, April the 26th at 7 p.m. here on Zoom. I second that. All right, there's a motion, Mr. McCusker, seconded by Mr. Gotti. Any further discussion? Seeing no further discussion, we'll have a roll call vote. Uh, Mr. Paff? Yes. Mr. McCusker? Yes. Ms. Conant? Yes. Mr. Gotti? Yes. And I vote yes as well. So we will continue this and look forward to more information. Thank, all right, you. thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Much. Thank you. All right. The next next thank item you. on our, thank you. Thanks a lot. The next item on our agenda is uh, not a public hearing. This is um, public meeting item um, related to 480 Summer Street. Um, Abby, can you summarize what's what's needed here? And um, we'll see if there. I don't know if anyone wants to comment on this, but if you could set it up and we'll see if. All right, yes. Um, so if you recall, um, 480 Summer Street was before you um, recently, we had discussed um, a temporary occupancy and, and requirements for occupancy. And um, one of the outstanding items um, has been recording at the Registry of Deeds, the um, 2017 shared permit um, shared driveway special permit, the actual written decision, and the um, the the um, plans, the shared driveway plans to be recorded at the registry. Um, the applicant, um, the Mahanas, let me know recently they did go to um, the registry to record that information. Um, however, it was uh, rejected. Um, the decision was rejected because it referenced the old lot numbers. Um, so the request tonight is for you to um, reissue the 2017 um, special permit with the updated lot numbers um, that were assigned by the land court, which um, for those three lots are lots um, 10, 11, and 12. Um, previously, it was listed in the 2017 approval as lots 7, 8, and 9. Um, just by way of um, background, it's it's not typical that materials recorded at the um, registry and land court. Oftentimes, um, if there's registered land, the A and R plan creating the lots is um, goes to the land to the land court. So that that's what happened. Um, the special permit was approved in 2017. Then there was the lot creation plan that went to the register. The land court in 2018, and in 2018 they updated and assigned new lot numbers. Um, however, when the applicant went recently to record that information, um, they noted that the decision referenced the old lot numbers. So tonight, um, what's before you, I consider an administrative item to reissue the decision with the new lot numbers that were assigned. Um, by the land court. That way, both the um, plan that you in, um, endorsed and signed recently, along with the decision, can be recorded and will then be on file at the registry as well as the land court. Thanks, Abby. Um, anyone, would someone like to make a motion and then we can have discussion? We're making a motion to approve what Abby just requested us. Okay, I'll, I'll make a motion <laughs> to I, approve I, Abby's I did, explanation. If it All helps, right. I had included a draft motion in your summary. I don't All know right. if you have, you have that. I don't have that in front of me, sorry. Okay. Abby, why don't you procedurally, if you read the motion okay. and then someone can say so move. Right. Okay. All right. The, the suggested motion is a motion to reissue the August 22nd, 2017 shared driveway special permit with the updated lot numbers per the land court's lot assignments by amending page one and conditions two, three, four, and five to be lots 10, 11, and 12, as shown on the 5840F land court plan. So move. I'll second it. 
Is there any is there any discussion? I'm seeing no discussion. So let's uh, have a roll call vote. Mr. Payaf? Yes. Uh, Mr. McCusker? Yes. Mr. Gotti? Yes. Ms. Conant? Yes. And I vote yes as well. So that will be taken care of. And we can move on to the another public hearing. Uh, so this is our zoning amendments. We continued the um, the discussion of our zoning amendments, um, just the background, as everyone knows, but we um, went to FinCom, uh, presented the presented to FinCom, FinCom discussed, and um, what happens now is that we will make our final vote on um, recommending these articles to town meeting, and then we we'll close close our public hearing, and um, town meeting would. We'll, we'll, take this up and since they're zoning articles, they would all require a two thirds vote at town meeting to take effect. Uh, and we can go through them, but I think we'll just, uh, what I would like to do, it's public hearing. So we'll go through each of the uh, zoning amendments and see if there's any discussion, if there's any public um, input. Um, and, um, and then we will go through and vote each of them separately. So first, uh, the first one is the, um, let me pull up the list again. So the first one is the zoning amendment rel rel relative to temporary structures and uses. Um, is there anyone who wishes to speak to this item? Any questions? I'm not seeing anyone raising their hand. So public comment, uh, raise your hand in the Zoom area. So I have a question from Phil Giordano. I recognize him to speak. This is for the, uh, we're gonna go one by one. So this is about the uh, zoning amendments relative to temporary structures and uses. Uh, I, would, I would suggest that on the sentence that says following approval at the end of the proposed uh, language that you add for good cause shown uh, before where the building commissioner may permit one extension of the six months. Uh, otherwise it becomes almost an automatic 12 month extension. And it provides just a little bit of a, uh, 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 not an obstacle, but a little bit of a check on the extension. That's just the extent of my comment. All right, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Giordano. Um, I'm seeing no other comments, any board member thoughts on this? I'm hesitant to um, make any changes since it's gone to uh, FinCom and, you know. Yeah, that's what I was just thinking was, how is it gonna be received by FinCom as we changing language, even subtly at this point? And it's somewhat implied as well, because you're if you're going to ask for the extension, you're going to have to show reasonable cause. I understand the, the suggestion, but I don't think we need to change language at this point in the game. Yeah, I think it may do more harm than good in this process. All right. Uh, any any further discussion? Then what we typically do is a motion to um, recommend that the town meeting vote to adopt, right, to adopt this amendment to the zoning bylaws. I'll make a motion that planning board article one be um, recommended to town meeting to adopt as written. Second. There's a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? Seeing no further discussion, we'll have a roll call vote. Uh, Mr. Paff? Yes. Mr. Gotti? Yes. Mr. McCusker? Yes. Ms. Conant? Yes. And I vote yes as well. So the first one is voted through. Uh, the second article, zoning amendment relative to firearms, explosive sales, and services. 
this removes that use from the local business A, local business B, and retains it in the highway business and industrial and through uh, board, uh, ZBA special permit. Mr. Chairman, point of order. Yes. Are you going to close the public hearing on all of them at the end? Is that your plan? Yes. I just, just don't want you to forget it. Right. Yes. Well, we, unless we want to have, you know, five votes. So I think we close the hearing. I thought no, about it's fine. Another option, you know, another option would be to have all public comment first and then close the public hearing and then we would just vote on everything. But I think we can just go through what we've done here. And so um, is there any um, any further any discussion of is there any public input? Anyone wanting to speak on this issue? Not seeing any hands raised. And I'm not seeing any additional Q&A questions. Any board member comments or questions? Not seeing that. Will someone make a motion? I'll make a motion to put planning board article two, zoning amendment relative to the firearms and explosive sales and services forward to town meeting um, for approval. All right, so seconded by Mr. Paff. Any further discussion? Seeing no further discussion, roll call vote. Mr. Paff? Yes. Mr. McCusker? Yes. Ms. Conant? Yes. Mr. Gotti? Yes. And I vote yes as well. So that's the second article. The third article. Planning Board Article 3, zoning amendments related to medical uses, medical centers or clinics, and offices of healthcare professionals. Is there anyone wishing to speak on this article or with a question? I'm seeing no hands raised in the comments. I'm seeing no Q&A. Would anyone, would someone like to make a motion on this one? I'll make a motion to put Planning Board Article 3, a zoning amendment related to medical uses, medical centers, or clinics, and Office of Healthcare Professionals, forward to town meeting for approval. And just to, and I think we, don't we typically, we need to say that the Planning Board recommends approval of this. It's, that's, I think it's sort of implicit, but just that's what you're, that's what we're, the motion, all these motions are that the planning board is recommending adoption of these things. So just if there's any. Dave, I believe procedure at town meeting is that the planning board gets to speak to address each zoning article um, as it pertains to the recommendation of the, uh, the Finn Warren and Finance Commission. So you get an opportunity to do that at the floor of town meeting. Yeah. I just to make it clear that we will what it's we're usually just reading this so basically saying the planning board recommends adoption that's the intention of what i'm thinking and then if it gets into a discussion if there's you know when there's the general discussion there might be additional planning board members to start talking about it but typically as i recall we would just say here's the report of the planning board we recommend adoption and then we see where it goes but that's uh all right, so let's see, are we on, on, we have a, what's our status here? Did we, I think we've moved article three. Rob made the uh, motion. Did we get a second? I'll second. Second to Mr. Paff. Any further discussion? All right, roll call vote. Mr. Paff? Yes. Mr. McCusker? Yes. Ms. Conant? Yes. Mr. Gotti? Yes. I vote yes as well. So that's the third article. Uh, planning Board Article 4, Zoning Amendments Related to Medical Uses Prohibiting Hospitals. Any further discussion or questions on this item from the public or board members? There is a hand raised. Mr. Giordano. Uh, the word designed is difficult for me. I would recommend operated as compared to designed which implies architectural or something else. Uh, I also have a concern about the use of the word and as compared to or in the diagnosis and treatment of the patients. 
So I would suggest, and I recognize that you already are dealing with FinCom, et cetera, but it is an awkward definition of a building operated for or used for the diagnosis or treatment of human patients for outpatient or overnight care, period. That would be my recommendation. I find this to be difficult by the use of the word designed and used, and then the use of the word and is, is overly restrictive and it would be difficult to, uh, to be able to use that. All right, thank you. Thank you for your comment, Mr. Giordano. Any, does anyone want to have further discussion? Well, I'd like to ask Mr. Ahern if he agrees with Mr. Giordano or are we on solid ground as written? Unmute. Um, I think it's a fairly clear definition. Um, I, you know, Mr. Giordano's a practicing attorney. We used to have a saying in my family, two attorneys, three opinions. Um, I think you're okay with the way it's written. It's been through a lot of it's been through a lot of scrutiny. Uh, it's been supported. I think you, at this point in time, should not alter it. All right. Thank you, Mr. Hearn. Any other, any other questions or comments? All right. Is there a motion to uh, recommend town meeting adopt this? I will make a motion that planning board article four a zoning amendment related to medical uses prohibiting hospitals be put forward to town meeting for approval. Second. All right, there's a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, uh, roll call vote. Change the order around for fun here. So Ms. Conant. Yes. Uh, Mr. McCusker? Yes. Mr. Gotti? Yes. Mr. Paff? Yes. And I vote yes as well. That is Article 4. Planning Board Article 5, Zoning Amendments Related to Medical Uses, Creating Substance Rehabilitation Facility Overlay District. Is there any, any discussion on this one? Is there anyone wishing to speak on this topic? I have a hand raised. Mr. Giordano, you have the floor. And you are, we should be able to hear you. I thought I clicked on mute. Uh, I would insert the word unaffiliated in the definitional term uh, 2.0 under med, uh, medical center. I also have a concern with the word similar on the Office of Healthcare Professional. The word similar is, again, uh, not to butt heads with Mr. Hearn, who's an excellent attorney, uh, is something that strikes me as uh, overly broad and difficult to, uh, uh, to enforce. Uh, I would either insert the word licensed or something comparable to that. But I do think the word unaffiliated in a medical center or clinic would be appropriate. Are you, where, where are you saying yeah. that? Going? On line two, line two, where it says, which contains two or more offices of unaffiliated healthcare professionals, et cetera. I would insert the word unaffiliated there. Unaffiliated with each other or with the, like- what? I think the word affiliated is implied as compared to the it's too much to say not operating as a single practice. So I would leave that, which is fine. Um, but unaffiliated essentially, I think would probably cover the, the healthcare professionals. The, the phrase not operating as a single practice is uh, difficult, but uh, I think if you just include the concept of affiliation, you'd be fine. Okay, I'm, I'm just, I'm thinking of knowledge of, there are a lot of 
uh, providers who are affiliated um, in networks and things, and it's very different from being in a practice together. So I don't know. To me, it, it makes it more, I'm more confused. But um, anyway, uh, any other thoughts on that? Pat, you have a thought? I do not have a thought on this. I'm trying to, it's a lengthy article. I'm trying to figure out what exactly his recommended input is. So page on the memo, page five of nine, the definition, <clears throat> oops. So, um, yeah, right in the middle there. Uh, Medical center or clinic, yes. a building or portion thereof designed or used for the diagnosis and treatment of human patients, which contain two or more offices of healthcare professionals not operating as a single practice and which, in which building is neither a hospital nor a substance rehabilitation or treatment facility. And Mr. Giordano, if you're still on, what, what did you want to put? I'm sorry. If someone knows. Oh, I can we? There I am. Uh, on line two, Mr. Hearn, where it yep. says, which contains two or more offices of, of health care professionals, a single Not practice, I, I would insert the word unaffiliated is, is my point. I think that's really a. I think that's really a distinction without much of a difference. I think you're okay, considering you've been through the process. It would be the place. Yeah, I. I don't recommend you make that change. I'm not saying Mr. Giordano is wrong, but you've got a definition that I think works and can be interpreted correctly. Right, uh, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Hearn, uh, any uh, any further discussion? Not seeing any further discussion. Would someone like to make a motion? I'll make a motion that Planning Board Article Five zoning amendments related to medical uses, creating substance abuse and rehabilitation facility overlay district, be put forward recommending uh, approval to town meeting. Second. All right, there's a motion by Mr. Gotti, seconded by Mr. McCusker. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, we will have a roll call vote. Uh, Mr. Gotti? Yes. Ms. Conant? Yes. Mr. McCusker? Yes. Mr. Paff? Yes. I vote yes as well. And that is the fifth article. Article six is the housekeeping article, correct? Any discussion of that? Not seeing anyone wanting to speak on the housekeeping article. So um, would someone make the motion? I get a clean sweep. I'll make a motion for planning board article six. Uh, where is it here? Let's make it get it right. Planning board article six, where is the thing? Uh, it's just called housekeeping. Uh, yeah, the, the housekeeping article be put forward as written to town meeting for approval by the planning board. Second. Okay. All right, uh, motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, um, roll call, Mr. Paff. Yes. Mr. McCusker. Yes. Mr. Gotti. Yes. And Ms. Conant. Yes. Yes. And I vote yes as well. So that article six is also recommended to town meeting. And that can I have a motion to close the public hearing on the zoning amendment articles? I'll make a motion that we close the public hearing for our zoning amendment articles. Doug. All right, we have a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, roll call vote. Mr. Paff? Yes. Mr. McCusker? Yes. Mr. Gotti? Yes. Ms. Conant? 
And I vote yes as well. And the public hearing on zoning amendments is closed. All right, we have other business items. We have draft meeting minutes uh, from March 1st and from March 16th. Are there any corrections to the March 1st meeting minutes? I have one correction. Um, on page four of six, um, I made the comment of a substance abuse facility in Canton wanting to go in. And it's just sort of, it's that incomplete sentence that says it was denied and Canton went through process. So the actual comment was that they went through a pro they went through a process of zoning it and now have one coming in. It was just an end, didn't end. The sentence was just partially there. And that's it. Right, uh, Jessica, do you find that? Can you fix that? I, I found it. I think. Yeah, thank you. I, I have it's hard for me to look at both minutes at the same time. It was a long meeting, Deb. <laughs> <laughs> what, a, a I long must have zoned off for a minute. <laughs> um. All right, is that, do we have that corrected? Are we good? Any other corrections? All right, uh, is there, can we have a motion to approve those minutes? Make a motion to approve the minutes for both March 1st and March 16th, 2000. Oh, can I, if we're gonna go back to the 16th, I have two edits for the 16th. Oh, actually, we're, let's do them one at a time. Yeah. Okay. okay, so I'll make a motion to approve the minutes for March 1st planning board meeting. Mr. Chairman, point of order. Yeah. Yes, Mr. Hearn. You make the motion uh, uh, with Ms. Conant's changes? As, to say as amended. As, as amended? Yeah. Mr. McCuska? Understood. All right, so is you that, Is that your motion, Mr. McCuska? It is. Second. All right, there's a motion and a second. Uh, roll call vote, Mr. Paff. Yes. Mr. McCusker. Yes. Ms. Conant. So I think I need to abstain because I left the meeting before it ended. Okay. If, if you know, well, we can talk the, um, I think you can do, you can still vote or you can abstain. So she's free to, she's free to abstain if that's where her conscience is on this particular situation. <laughs> okay. Um, let's see, so abstain and then Mr. Gotti. Yes. I vote yes as well. So the meeting minutes, there's a four zero one approval for the March 1st um, meeting minutes. Are there any, um, any corrections or updates to the uh, March 16th meeting yes. minutes? I just have two. Um, on page four, I made a comment um, where it says, what are the uses, question mark. And then I didn't say uh, licensing would be redundant. Nora said that. So that was someone else's oh, comment. Okay. All right. And then on page six, um, I said, do we have conditions? And then someone else also said, um, there was a whole other couple of sentences that I didn't say. Someone else said it. I don't know who said it. it Might've been Nora. Yeah. So if we can just... Put them, put them, um, made those comments. All right, can you, can you find those? All right, I think Debbie, it was at the top of um, page six for your second, the other comments, is that right? Where it says, do we have conditions? I can't, I don't have it in front of me. I just wrote down. Um, yeah, that was at the top of page six. Okay, so it was, um, after that, I think it was, I think myself and Nora had yes, responded. Yeah. I had one other change to right before the action taken. Um, Dave, at one point you had asked a, a question, what if we zone this at Allied Drive and a facility actually comes there, how would we feel then? 
Chris then enumerated a list of reasons why we needed to have that done and that this may be the best location and opportunity to get it done. And then I sort of added to Chris's comments and, and offered an alternative to your question where I asked, what if we fail to take any action and kick the can down the road and a facility comes to a, some other residential neighborhood where we're all on the record as having agreed that we have exposure, having agreed that we want to retain control and all agree that we didn't believe it belonged in a residential neighborhood. How would we feel in that instance? Did we do the job we were elected to do? And I think that was part of, you know, the decision-making process. So I think it's worth noting. Right, Rob had given me those comments earlier today. So I included those, it was on um, page four under the board discussion. I had added those three bullets. Yep, that's, I'm fine with that. I think, you know, our, our meeting minutes are very detailed and um, that's what we've wanted to do. So um, well, that's, it's fine. I mean, that they, they, they're very detailed, I'll just say. Um, any, any other, any changes or anything else? All right. Just motion to accept the board uh, meeting minutes from 316 as amended this evening by Deb's comments and my comments. Second. Motion and a second. Uh, no further, any further discussion? Nope. Uh, roll call vote, Mr. Paff? Yes. Mr. Gotti? Yes. Mr. McCusker? Yes. Ms. Conant? Yes. And I vote yes as well. So those minutes are accepted. And I don't see anything, uh, other updates. Abby, can you please uh, give us, there were some items in the uh, in our notes, but uh, what's the latest news on um, development? The, um, well, I had sent you today, there's some fair housing um, trainings coming up too. If you had seen that email just this afternoon, um, the housing agent had let us know their um, kind of later this month or, or starting next week, there's some more trainings that you might be interested in. I think most of them were free and on um, Zoom. Um, Wentworth Hall and um, the you know, new library and community center is moving along and expected to be open in um, July. Um, a pet shop was looking to move into where the um, old yoga studio um, is at 311 Washington Street. Um, at least they they applied um, for some um, interior renovations and for a signed permit. Um, also a um, photography studio at 372 Washington Street. That's the that was a little building um, next to Roach Brothers. All right. And then, and yeah, and then a hair salon um, at the old. Um, on the lower level of the old CVS building. So the newly renovated building. So Abby, and I'm not trying to, I don't wanna make the meeting go on any longer than necessary, but just a, it occurred to me a question of, so when there's a change of use, so for these, like, why is, why don't we end up with endless EIDRs and stuff? Like, so there's typically a change of use for something right would trigger an environmental impact design review, but clearly having a hair salon go in where a army recruiting or whatever was there, it's, it's not causing us to have to go through that process. I'm just curious. Right, a, a change of use is a um, trigger for an, um, for an EIDR. Um, however, if there's, we also have something in our bylaw, if it's um, considered de minimis or you know very minor by the building commissioner, it can be re, um, reviewed administratively. So um, that's an application um, to me, an administrative EIDR that goes to me. Um, so that's usually when there is a change of use with um, no exterior changes or very minor exterior changes. Um, so usually if the parking is the same um, or no parking impact, and usually if they're updating um, you know, only, only signage. Um, so it's an administrative approval without going through a full op application um, process with the planning board. And that's the building commissioner 
makes that determination. Yep, it goes um, first to the building commissioner and then it goes to me for a review. All right, is there anything else that we need to cover tonight? And then I would be happy to hear a motion to adjourn. I make a motion that we adjourn. Second. Motion and a second. A roll call vote, Mr. Paff? Yes. Mr. Gotti? Yes. Mr. McCusker? Yes. Ms. Conant? Yes. And I vote yes as well. And we are adjourned to meet again on April 26th at 7 p.m. on Zoom. Have a good night, everybody. Thank you. Good night. Bye. Thanks, everyone.